everyone to another episode of Faith Unaltered. How are y'all doing today? <laughs> I'm doing just, just fine. Uh, so this is my episode with Dr. Tim Stratton that re we actually pre-recorded Friday uh, morning. And I wanted to jump on here real quick and just give just a little, little disclaimer. Um, so for about the first 40 minutes of this recording, unfortunately, we were having a little bit of technical difficulties. Uh, Tim's microphone kept popping. We eventually got it figured out. We paused the recording to, to try to figure this out one more time. Uh, and we did. We did figure it out. So the popping that you hear for about the first 40 minutes, it will cease. It will cease. Um, but I would encourage everyone to watch that. There's some good information uh, in there just knowing that the popping will stop. Other than that, set back, enjoy my conversation with Dr. Tim Stratton from Free Thinking Ministries. God bless. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Faith Unaltered. I am your host for this evening, Tyler Fowler, and with me is my special guest, Dr. Tim Stratton. I am doing a solo episode today with Dr. Stratton. We're actually pre-recording this episode, so we will not be taking your questions uh, live as we normally do since this is a pre-recorded episode, um, but I'm excited to talk with Dr. Stratton today about more determinism, Calvinism, Molinism, all of that fun stuff that uh, Dr. Stratton and I have talked about before. If y'all have not seen our previous episodes, we have a playlist that you could, it's got over 24 hours of content on it right now. Nothing but determinism, compatibilism, Calvinism, things like that. Uh, so Dr. Stratton, welcome. It's been a little bit since you've been on. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tyler. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with you. You've just become a, a dear friend and got to say, uh, Josh, miss having you on the show today, but uh, our schedules were crazy and we had to record in the morning and he's got to work. I'm going to be on the road here pretty soon. So uh, that's just the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. But uh, man, it's just awesome to be here and just love having these conversations. I know that uh, you and I have talked about this even before we started recording today, and we just want the truth. We, we don't even care so much about the positions that we currently believe are the, you know, the, the inferences to the best explanation of all the data that we, you know, so for me as a Molinist, I'm like, yeah, I'm a Molinist because I think it's the best explanation of all the data. In fact, in this book, I wrote the last sentence of the entire book uh, makes it clear um, that's why I'm a Molinist, but I don't hold to it with a tight grip. Um, I'm more committed to truth. And if arguing against a certain view that we can see is false also shows problems in my current view, I'm like, I don't care. 
Now, I don't think it does, mm -hmm. but um, I here's my point. You and I care about truth more than anything else, and we're just trying to find it. We're not trying to be mean to anybody else. We're not attacking somebody else's character or their scholarship. Uh, in fact, we, we're, we're interacting with people that have great character and great scholarship. We can't all be right, and we're just trying to get the truth together. And so that's how I see this conversation um, Absolutely. at large and the one that we're going to have today. Absolutely. I've said it multiple times, you know, uh, on Faith Unaltered, like it's not about labels for me. I don't care what yeah. my label is. If Mormonism was true, I would be a Mormon today. Right. Yeah, Mormon. right, right. Mm -hmm. It's not about labels for me. Dr. Shriden said it perfectly. It's about seeking truth. What is yeah. truth? And how more importantly, maybe even is how can I practically apply truth to my life? Mm -hmm. Right. And so but first, before we got to do that, we've got to figure it out first. And so yeah. that's what we're doing here today. Um, so Dr. Stratton, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, a scientist, uh, science isn't, a scientist isn't in the business of proving things mm. to be true. What they do is disprove <laughs> certain things. Right. They take different uh, hypotheses off the table and get that, uh, the data set that's left on the table smaller and smaller and smaller so we can make an inference to the best explanation. Well, theology is the science of God, right? And, uh, and so that's what we're doing as theologians. And so I'm more committed to ruling out certain hypotheses uh, than, I, than I am to saying this, uh, you know, Molinism must be true, for example. Um, I, I'm not doing that. But what I am as a, a, a scientist who studies God and related matters, <laughs> you know, that's what a theologian is. I'm, I'm working to uh, disprove certain hypotheses. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Amen. Amen. Well, let's jump into it, shall we? I think we've got a lot to talk about today. So before we begin, I'll give some background info uh, to what really provoked this conversation uh, with Tim is uh, a couple days ago, we had Israel Trujillo on the show to talk about his response and his interaction with Dr. Stratton about a video that Dr. Stratton released. Uh, when was that released? Last week, I, I do believe, a couple yeah. weeks ago? Well, oh, oh, the Okay, so I did a video. Mm -hmm. um, first video I did on my YouTube channel, Free Thinking Ministries. Yeah. I did one called uh, Calvinism, A Different Gospel. That eventually led to... Um, now, a lot of this, all these videos are really spinoffs from the academic uh, journal article uh, that I co-authored with J.P. Moreland called An Explanation and Defense of the Free-Thinking Argument. So all of this is backed up. The foundation of this is uh, on solid academic peer-reviewed ground, right? So on top of that, then I tried to, you know, uh, use that and bring it down to uh, a popular level um, so that it's not just academics discussing these things, but everybody can benefit from it. Um, so that's what I do on my YouTube channel. Uh, now, I did a video then um, defending the second premise of what I call the deity of deception argument. Mm -hmm. And that video was called an epistemic case against Calvinism or something like that. Yep. Um, Nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, the thumbnail says a courtroom drama. Mm -hmm. um, so I encourage people to, to check those out. That video was responded to and objected to uh, by Israel Trujillo, and uh, and that was on the Mere Molinism Facebook group, uh, in that group. Uh, you don't have to be a Molinist to be in that group, and uh, you just have to abide by certain rules, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and Israel um, is a, a friend who rejects Molinism, um, and he's a Calvinist, and he's a determinist. He thinks that God determines all things. And so he was rejecting and ob objecting to my video. And I thought his objection in that Facebook group, uh, I thought it was great. And uh, I mean, I obviously disagreed and saw some things I wanted to say, but it was well written. And I said, I, I asked him for permission. I said, can I respond to you on my website, on, on the Free Thinking Ministries uh, website? And he said, sure, go ahead. So I did. And I wrote a 3000 word. Uh, response. Uh, from there, that inspired him to come on to your show 
and provide a two and a half hour response to my 3000 words, which could be read in 10 minutes. And so, mm -hmm. so this, uh, this is kind of a problem uh, now because I've got two and a half hours worth of material that I can respond to. And that could lead to a five hour video. And, and so I don't want to go just there. keeps snowballing, right? It does. It just gets <laughs> frustrating. And so, you know, in a recent, another, you know, video I did, um, called, uh, debating rationality with robots. Good video. Um, what I, and I pointed when you, when you are debating a, you know, an artificial intelligence, what the artificial intelligence does that we can learn from is they respond, uh, with, with precision and in as few of words as possible. And I love that. And, uh, I'm not always the best at that. Uh, you know, but I'm trying to learn from robots and uh, <laughs> they can teach us something. <laughs> they can. Yeah. Yeah. We can learn from them in, in some senses. So anyway, we've got a lot to respond to. I'm going to try to yeah. respond. And so, I mean, sometimes I'll be forced to respond more at length than others, but let's just see what happens. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, so my thing I, is, and I'll just say this off the top with the video, I think uh, and given that this was kind of a quick thing that transpired between Israel and myself, uh, I think the video could have been a little bit more precise, first of all, yeah. and a little bit more ordered. Uh, we talked about ordering in that yeah. video, yeah, and yeah. it could have been a little bit ordered, but instead it had this scattered feel to it. I went back and listened to it. And I pulled what I thought were the highlights. And so uh, Dr. Stratton and I are going to be talking about the highlights today. But I'll just ask you this first and foremost. Um, what did you think of what you seen uh, from his responses in the video? Um, well, for, OK, I'm going to I've got a lot to say about that. But I do just want to start by saying, um, you know, that this this conversation was supposed to be focused on the deity of deception argument. And namely the second premise of the argument. But let me, I don't think the video always uh, really address that. <laughs> but I will say this. I want to sing Israel's praises. And I can tell that he thinks about these big metaphysical and theological issues all day, every day, just as I do. And in fact, uh, my stated goal on my website, the stated goal of Free Thinking Ministries is to apply good theology to everything. And so that allows us to talk about everything <laughs> you know we're gonna apply good theology to everything um so but that word everything makes me think about good theology constantly or at least strive to have good theology constantly but it seems to me that israel takes it just as seriously as i do and we just reach different conclusions now here's the thing our disagreement is either because god determines one of us to be wrong or one of us has not been as careful as we could have been and should have been while thinking things through so the former problem is an entailment of Israel's view of determinism. Mm -hmm. uh, the latter is the case if we both possess libertarian freedom. But Israel has many interesting things to say, and I encourage him to keep up the, the hard work and the deep thinking. Now, another thing I really like about Israel is that he, he seems really nice. Um, he, he's been very respectful to me so far. And, you know, I got to say, I'm not used to that when dealing with determinists uh, that they're, they're often rude and, and they come out just swinging against me, <laughs> throwing haymakers. And then if I throw a little left-handed jab, I often get, Oh, Stratton is so rude and mean and arrogant. Look at what he's doing. I'm like, bro, you were, <laughs> you were throwing haymakers at me and I threw a little left jab. Um, <laughs> and I, it's just, I, I'm like, gee whiz. The little um, jab did it in for him, though. So yeah, yeah, that, well, that's you know, what happened. I, I, I used to be known for my left jab. So anyway, um, Israel is not like that. He seems mm -hmm. to come in peace. Um, but like me, if someone starts throwing punches, he's willing to throw, throw them right back. And uh, so I'm cool with that. Um, I want to come in peace and don't want to throw punches, but I'm more than willing to throw punches if somebody's throwing them at me. Um, but he and I have made a commitment to each other to, to strive not to throw these disrespectful punches, as it were. And we're seeking to be respectful during our disagreement. So that's a challenge. It is a challenge. It's really hard. Um, even if you are not trying to be disrespectful, 
you've got to take an extra step to make sure your interlo your interlocutor isn't feeling disrespected, even if that's not your intention. That's hard to do, but I think we're trying to do it. So yeah, I mean, it's always a challenge to crit critique another's view without slipping into what at least seems to be disrespect. So Tyler, I'm going to ask you to help me walk that tightrope. And if you see me crossing any, any lines, I want you to hold me accountable. Is I that cool? You. I got All you, right. man. I'll be your battle buddy. I got you. Okay. So let me begin by pointing out that I, I did not think the interview that you did with Israel addressed the main point of the argument that was under dispute. Hmm. And so, as I already made clear, with all due respect to Israel, the interview seemed to be scattered and all over the place. Now, I'm not saying that's Israel's fault. It might have been your fault. It was my <laughs> fault. I'll take the blame. <laughs> I'm not saying it's your fault. But just the nature of an interview, and we might even run into the same problems today. Who knows? Hmm. But the argument I've offered against Ed, uh, exhaustive divine determinism, and my 3,000-word written response to Israel was never defeated, or so it seems to me. Now, unless I miss something, which is quite possible, I, I got to say, you know, my, my first response to Israel after the video came out, I was like, bro, I wrote 3,000 words responding to you, and you responded to that with the two and a half hour video. Um, I said, can you at least write this out for me um, so that I know I can pinpoint exactly what I need to deal with? And he said, well, just go back and look. If you just watch the first hour of the video. So I did that. I went and yeah. I watched the. I watched the first hour and it's possible I missed something here, but nowhere did I see the pertinent information relevant to the specific topic under discussion. There was no refutation of the second premise of the deity of deception argument or the, or the argument in general, not that I saw. And, and please note that my argument does not depend. I mean, a lot of what he was talking about was a colloquial understanding of what it means to be deceived. My argument does not depend on colloquial understandings. It does not assume or entail coercion either. It, coercion is ir irrelevant. Um, it simply relies on what follows from Ed. A deity determines all Christians to affirm false metaphysical and theological beliefs. Mm -hmm. and, and then if one, in response, appeals to their intuition, as we saw on your show, when I debated Chris State, I'm attacking their intuition. So it doesn't make any sense to I don't have that intuition. Well, look, I've raised defeaters against trusting your intuitions. So then to say to, to fall back on your intuition doesn't help. See, so I, I'm raising a defeater against Israel's intuitions, thus appealing to his intuition to escape my argument raised against his intuitions is question begging. It does mm -hmm. not work. So mm -hmm. my arguments show that if ed if exhaustive divine determinism is true then a deity is trustworthy trustworthy to determine all christians including israel to affirm false metaphysical and theological beliefs and this is what leads to what i describe as epistemic meltdown mm -hmm. and what i saw in the in the video uh the most i seemed to hear was well look if substance dualism is true then God is also a deity of deception. And, and he was careful to note that, yeah, I am a substance dualist, but I'm quite open to idealism. And I think you and I will talk about what idealism is here pretty soon. It but, did sound like that was the, the thrust of his argument. If he was to respond to a to your second premise, right? The substance dualist thing, I think, was it, if, if that was. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So Yeah, just my yeah, thoughts. yeah. Now, now, look, I'd argue that, number one, it is false that substance dualism has the problems he's uh, uh, trying to say that we have. I'd say that it's false, and I will argue against that. Sure. Number two, I'd say if he's right, if it's true that substance dualism has those problems, so what? It's irrelevant because, you know, how, how does saying that, oh, well, you too, you've got the same problem that I've got. Well, that still means you've got the same problem. <laughs> that still means you've got, if you say, oh yeah, well, I've got this problem and you've got it too. I'm like, okay, you still got the problem. You've got you to deal with it. it. Too. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And that's called, that's the problem with the two quoque objection. And it becomes fallacious at that point. It's a two quoque 
fallacy mm -hmm. when it's raised against somebody who really doesn't care if so. And I don't care. I've said this before. I'm like, okay, I'm a Molinist uh, and I'm, I'm launching my torpedoes at the ship of determinism of exhaustive mm -hmm. divine determinism. And let's say my my torpedo blast just destroy exhaustive divine determinism, that Calvinistic view. Mm -hmm. um, I think these torpedoes do destroy the view. And but, for well, me. Just, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, let's say uh, my battleship was too close. I, I was too close to the Ed battleship when I launched my torpedoes. Mm -hmm. And so the blast that destroyed exhaustive divine determinism also destroys Molinism. You know, they, they want to say, oh, you've got the same problem. Okay, let's just say that blast destroys my ship in the process. I don't care. Right? <laughs> I will it's a bold abandon. statement. Right? <laughs> I don't care. I am. I think Molinism is the inference to the best explanation of all the data. Yeah. But if that, if that torpedo of truth that destroys exhaustive divine determinism also takes Molinism down, then that's a victory. Why? Because I care more about truth than I do about Molinism. And so mm. if Molinism, if the ship of Molinism happens to sink along with the ship of exhaustive divine determinism, I'm going to jump out the ship because I know my open theist friends are going to throw me a, a life preserver and happily bring me on board. Look, right. bro, your Eastern Orthodox friend is going to throw well, you one first. Okay? Right, so right, right. I'm I mean, just I've saying. got a lot of friends. <laughs> I've got a lot of uh, other friends. Now, I will say I don't think I'm too close, and I've argued why I don't think I'm too close to the blast. Uh, I think Molinism is still on solid ground. But mm. even if I'm wrong about that, um, I don't care. I'm more committed to truth. So that's why two quoque objections um, don't work. They have no teeth in their bite against the guy who's more committed to truth than he is to what he currently thinks is the inference to the best explanation of all the data. And that's me. Right. And I made this clear in the last sentence of my mere Molinism book. So check it out. Yeah. Um, but let me say, let me say this one more time. Israel does have many interesting thoughts that he's obviously pondered for a really long time. And he's also nice and charitable in the heat of disagreement. And I totally respect him. He's an extremely smart young man who's about to get married. And I'm praying for him and his bride to have an, a wonderful, awesome marriage, uh, a beacon of, of light glorifying Christ in this crazy world. <laughs> we need yeah. strong Christian marriages. And I'm praying for him to have exactly that. And you know what? It's just too bad that one of us has to be wrong on this issue. I think he's the one making mistakes, but I'm I'm open uh, to being the one who's wrong here. And that's what, why these conversations are so awesome. You know, you said it in multiple videos, Tim, and, and I think we've even said it, you know, on episodes that we've done in the past. And and just to reiterate it for, for the, the final time, if, if it will be a final time, right? Again, we don't care about truth. Or, or we care about truth. We don't care about labels. We don't care right, about labels. Right, right. We mm -hmm. care about truth. And again, and and I'm right there with you. You know, if Molinism gets blown up in the blast, okay, I'll, I'll figure out something yeah. else. You see, I'll write another book. It, there you go. There you yeah. go. So yeah. let's let's do this. So I there was an interesting uh, Facebook exchange, right? And Colton Carlson, our good buddy Colton, yeah. uh, jumped in on this. And I want to get your thoughts. So, so let's put the brakes on Israel for just a second. And okay. let's, I want to see how Colton has been interacting with you on Israel's Facebook page. So let me read Colton's comment. Then, if you would be so kind, uh, Tim, will you please read what you wrote for our audience in response? Because I honestly found it extremely helpful. And I think our audience will too. So this is what Colton said. He says, quote, Tim Stratton, you've said this many times, but here's two versions from this thread. By a deity of deception, I simply am referring to a supernatural deity who intentionally uses his power to necessitate your false metaphysical and theological beliefs. Two, I have explained what I mean by deception. A productive interlocutor needs to deal with the concept I've been clear to advance. The concept of what I'm advancing does not need the word deceptive. For the argument mm -hmm. to move forward, it simply yeah. needs to show that on Ed, a deity determines all Christians to affirm false theological beliefs. So that's uh, so, so that's yep. what I said. So he's quoting me right. there. Right. So now this is Colton, right? I don't understand. Okay. So if a God determines all things and all 
includes one's false theological and I suppose metaphysical beliefs, then this God, yeah, exactly. Then this God is tantamount to a deity of deception. Okay, so if I understand this correctly, this is just your premise one, right? Here is the argument. A1, if it is true, then God determines all Christians to affirm some false theological beliefs. A2, Mm -hmm. if God determines all Christians to affirm some false theological beliefs, then God is deceptive and his word, the Bible, cannot be trusted. A3, God is not deceptive and his word can be trusted. A4, therefore, God does not determine all Christians to affirm some false theological beliefs. A5, therefore, Ed is false. Colton goes on. I don't think any determinist will deny A1. It is true by definition. But why would a compatibilist determinist, in the sense of someone who believes also that God's goodness is compatible with his divine determination of all things, accept premise A2? This now becomes a prob- problem of evil issue, and determinists are welcome to any proposed solutions, i.e. soul building, divine intimacy, Ophelix culpa, compatibilist free will defense, etc. So there is no independent reason a compatibilist determinist understood in the sense of one who believes in the compatibility of God's goodness and his determining evil if deception is indeed considered an evil, which we are not told that it is in fact evil. You have to just assume that it is. Should accept premise A2. Think of this as a soft line reply. A hard line reply could accept premise A2, but reject the conjunction of the consequent as it doesn't seem to follow. Where is the argument that all deception is bad or morally evil? Why does it follow that if God is therefore deceptive, then it just must be true that his word then cannot be trusted? I suppose you could give your usual analogy by arguing that if Johnny is a known liar, would you trust him? Or something along those lines. But why does it follow that if God is in fact deceptive, then he is therefore a liar in morally objectionable senses? The French family hiding Jews from the Nazis could tell the Nazis that they are not in fact hiding Jews. First glance, they are lying and they are being deceptive. But do we blame the French family for their lying and deception? I don't have that intuition at all. (laughs) So these preliminary thoughts reveal, to my mind anyway, a shortcoming of your argument. Namely, it bites way too much off than it can actually chew. Your argument to be successful needs to relate lying to deception or show that it that is a connection if there is not a connection. And if deception is actually always morally wrong with the same with lying, and if one lies to another in a sort of deceptive manner, this automatically means that trust has been violated. A short skim through the above Stanford Encyclopedia article on lying and deception will quickly reveal that many of your assumptions embedded behind the scenes of your premises can have doubt cast upon them. To me, this is not a good start to an argument. So my question, Tim, and and then that's the end quote. How did you respond to that long list there uh, from our good friend Colton? Yeah, well, first, I I just want to say that I thought Colton's uh, objection there was well written and and absolutely kind, right? It was just a good, uh, good response by somebody who's objecting. uh, But but I didn't feel like it was uh, like he was trying to attack my character or my scholarship there or anything like that. And I'm like, okay, this is the kind of uh, interaction that I'm looking for. And so, thank you, Colton. Um, Now. This is what I wrote in response to Colton. I said, Colton, although there's some misunderstandings here, your question is fantastic as it allows us to pinpoint these issues. Um, I wrote, you said, I don't think any determinist will deny A1. It is true by definition, but why would a compatibilist determinist in the sense of someone who believes also that God's goodness is compatible with his divine determination of all things, except premise A2? And I said, great question. Recall that I'm not attacking the goodness of God. After all, for the sake of argument, I grant uh, Guillaume Bignon's response to me that God might have morally sufficient reasons to determine all of his followers to affirm uh, false theological beliefs. 
The problem is that all of his followers are determined to affirm false theological beliefs. So as I made clear in my recent video, this view of compatibilism is not under attack. I'm showing that other important things are not compatible with exhaustive divine determinism. And that point is so important not to miss. Mm -hmm. I continue to say, moreover, I think it's ad hoc to not accept the second premise. If I, uh, as I've argued elsewhere, here's a section from my recent epistemic meltdown article responding to Israel. And now I'm referring to the, uh, the article that I wrote called Epistemic Meltdown on my website. Here's a quote from, uh, a black quote from that, uh, uh, from that article. And I said, think about it. If a wizard, a demon, or a Jedi using a mind trick use their power to necessitate your false beliefs, then these folks would properly be referred to as deceptive agents. Now, suppose a Jedi intentionally used his power to determine and necess necessitate all people to affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality, right? He's going to do, do a Jedi mind trick. Well, it would be fair to describe this fellow as a Jedi of deception. If a demon used his power to determine and necessitate all humans to affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality, it would be fair to say that this being is a demon of deception. And then I asked, what's the difference between a demon of deception and a deity of deception? Does a deity who intentionally uses his power to determine and necessitate all humans to affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality suddenly become non-deceptive just because this being has more power than demons? Is this deity who determines all humans to affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality suddenly become non-deceptive just because he created the universe? If Loki, the god of mischief, created the universe, is he no longer a god of mischief? Of course not. Loki is still untrustworthy, and so is any deity who intentionally uses his power to determine every single human, including all Christ followers, including all Calvinists, to affirm false theological beliefs. Yeah. End quote. And then I continued to respond to Colton, and I said, it's clear that this is not a problem of evil issue at least not as it's typically advanced. I think my argument might be able to be used as a first step of another problem of evil issue, but I'm not attempting to make that case here. And then uh, addressing Colton, I said, you said, so there is no independent reason a compatibilist determinist understood in the sense of one who believes in the compatibility of God's goodness and his determining evil if deception is indeed considered an evil, which we are not told that it is, in fact, evil. You've just assumed that it is. Uh, why should this person accept premise A2? Think of this as a soft line reply. And the and Colton's quote. <laughs> and I said, to reiterate, I am not considering divine deception a necessary evil. I am granting it for the sake of argument, even though it seems to contradict Hebrews 6.18, unless God has morally sufficient reasons to be deceptive about that too. Now, with that reply, just side note here, you can start to see how everything is going to crumble, how, how this leads to epistemic meltdown. Right. Um, if scripture is clear that God doesn't lie, and then what the Calvinist says, yeah, but God's got morally sufficient reasons to lie, well, then why should we believe scripture when he says... It's impossible for God. He could be lying about that too, you know, and then you have to start questioning every single Bible verse. Anyway, let me get back to what I said. I, for the sake of argument, I, I can grant it for now. And I said, I'm not assuming all deception is always evil. This specific argument has nothing to do with a quote unquote evil God. Yeah. And Colton said a hardline reply could accept premise a two, but reject the conjunction of the consequent as it doesn't seem to follow. Where is the argument that all deception is bad or morally evil? End quote. And I said, I said, I've not made, I've not made one. And this is irrelevant to my case. Indeed, as I have made clear elsewhere, sometimes it's good to deceive Nazis on your doorstep when you're hiding Jews in the basement. Yep. But no, 
Just because it is good to deceive in this scenario, it does not mean that the good person did not deceive. So even if it's good for God to deceive all of the elect on important theological matters, all of the elect are still deceived on important theological matters. And that's the point, and that's the problem. And uh, Colton asks, why does it follow that if God is therefore deceptive, then it must be true that his word then cannot be trusted. That's a good question. It is a good question. Yep. And I said, for the same reason that Cato's testimony could not be trusted in the video I offered. Now, this gets us back to the epistemic case against Calvinism video found on my YouTube channel. Yep. And then I said, let's suppose that Cato had morally sufficient reasons to do everything he did while on the witness stand it still follows that his testimony cannot be trusted even if Cato is a great guy who deceived the court for morally sufficient reasons and for our ultimate benefit. Moreover, if one is willing to say that God has morally sufficient reasons to, to deceive all of his followers, then why should we trust a document he inspired? For all we know, this deity might have morally sufficient reasons to give us tons of false information about ultimate reality in that book. Right. And Colton writes, I suppose you could give your usual analogy by arguing that if Johnny is a known liar, would you trust him or something along those lines? But why does it follow that if God is in fact deceptive, then he is therefore a liar in a morally objectionable sense? Has nothing. End quote. And, and again, I, I reiterated, I said, I have not made that case. God might be a liar for morally sufficient reasons, which seems to contradict Hebrews 6.18. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, although that's a seemingly odd, unbiblical, and ad hoc move, I grant it. However, it's irrelevant to my case. Colton uh, makes the point, and he says, the French family hiding Jews from Nazis could tell the Nazis that they're not, in fact, hiding Jews. At first glance, they are lying. And they're being deceptive, but we don't blame the French family for their lying and deception. And then he says, I don't have that intuition at all. And I said, amen to that. Amen. You and I are on the exact same page on that matter. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah. share that same in, uh, intuition. They should not be blamed for lying to the Nazis. They should be praised. Right. And in that scenario, that was the objectively right thing to do. Right. Because um, they were loving their neighbors from evil and protecting them uh, against evil. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, the problem I write and I wrote to Colton, I said, the problem is that um, even though we're on the same page on that matter, we're not on the same page when it comes to the actual argument that I've advanced. I said, you seem to be defending a position I'm not attacking. And we seem to be ships passing by in the night. Right? But the argument on my ship is still untouched, I said. And I said, I hope that Helps, brother. Thank you for your questions, which allowed clarification. And so that's the end of. Uh, but now he he and I did have a couple other exchanges. He brought up. Okay. Um. What what he said? Well, what if my wife, um, uh, deceives me about a surprise birthday party that she's planning for me? Is she suddenly not deceptive? And I said, Well, okay, look. Um, or, or is she untrustworthy? And I said, well, she's at this point now, even if she's got morally sufficient reasons to deceive you about your birthday party, uh, she is a deceptive party planner. And therefore, next year, when you ask, what are we doing for my birthday? And she says, oh, nothing. You have reason to doubt. Right. So so now since she's got morally sufficient reasons. I'm not saying anything bad about her character here uh, at all. She sounds like a great person. Um, in fact, I, I encourage her to continue surprising Colton with awesome uh, birthday parties, right? Nice. But Colton, but Colton um, is never in a position to know, man, am I going to get surprised this year or not? Yeah. Um, so, so that's what I'm focused on. If God, if, if one's position enta is, entails that God deceives all of his followers on important theological matters, then when it comes to important theological matters, Welcome to epistemic meltdown. You don't know if your thoughts and beliefs, even the ones you think are justified, really are true right. and justified. Um, you're, you're determined by a deity of deception to think wrongly 
at times, maybe not all the time, but at least sometimes you're, and it's not that you're not reasons responsive. It's just that the manner in which you respond to reasons is determined by a deity of deception. That's not up to you. And so that's the big problem. Anyway, we probably talked about Colton a little too much since this is supposed to be uh, addressing Israel and yeah. his concerns, but Colton is a deep thinker. And uh, since he and Israel were kind of uh, teaming up on the same thread, uh, yeah. I thought it would be good to uh, address them. So no, and that's good because it took a minute for it this whole concept to click with me as well, right? You're not arguing a moral. Th this isn't a moral argument, no. right? No. Again, this is an epistemic argument, and for my audience that might not know what that word means, it's a knowledge claim. It's a claim. Yeah. It's an argument about knowledge. It's fine if God deceives and has moral sufficient arguments or, or reasons for doing so, right? That's not what's in question. What's in question is the fact that he's deceiving. And granted, I think Colton's hangup is that deception and evil, right? They do go hand in hand in most cases, right? Yeah. You can give a Frankfurt style example on which there's not an evil inclination, right? To deceive someone. The Nazis is a perfect example, but that seems to be the, in, in Colton's responses, and I say this with respect, that seems to be the hangup he's having and maybe most people would have because of that enigma, right? Deception yeah. is evil, so I automatically link the two together. This isn't an argument about God's nature. It's an argument about God deceiving people, period. All right, Tim. So my next question then is at around the 16-minute mark. So we're going to get back to Israel now. Um, around the 16-minute mark, Israel says that many non-Calvinists will say that libertarian free will isn't explicitly taught in Scripture. My question is, and I think I know your answer on this, but I want I want to hear it from you. Would you agree or disagree? And do you believe that libertarian free will is explicitly taught in Scripture? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, as you know, I've argued that the concept of libertarian freedom is found in multiple places throughout Scripture. And the same methodology that demands the verdict of the Trinity is the exact same methodology that affirms uh, libertarian freedom, that the concept of libertarian freedom is described in Scripture and implied by Scripture. So, uh, look, if one is free to reject libertarian freedom, then one is free to reject the Trinity. So we got to be really careful here. Um, you know, and one thing that I made clear to James White in our debate was, you know, I sang his praises about his book on uh, the Trinity called the forgotten Trinity. And, uh, and I said, look, you know, I, I use his exact same methodology that he used in that book to show that, uh, the Trinity is taught in scripture. I use the, his exact same methodology, uh, to show that libertarian freedom, um, is taught in scripture. And I went further to say that, uh, Molinism is biblical, um, which was the point of the entire debate. Uh, that was the topic under debate. Um, but anyway, I've, I'll say on top of that, I've argued that Ed, exhaustive divine determinism, is definitely not found anywhere in God's inspired word. Now, some things are determined, but not exhaustive divine determinism. So one can argue for, pre for predestination, but not exhaustive divine determinism. And in my book, I'm careful to show how those are two different things. In fact, I offered an argument logically uh, and deductively showing that those are two different things. Now, to see the absurdity of Ed, um, one simply needs to read scripture through deterministic lenses. In fact, on my website, uh, I have an article under that same name. I encourage people to go there, freethinkingministries.com or freethinkinc.org. Um, and look for a fairly recent article I wrote called Reading Scripture Through Deterministic Lenses. Hmm. And it's really kind of a uh, satire piece where I start, I'll give, I think I've got 52 different passages and I, I just stopped there. I've got many more uh, that I could have shared. Wow. But I kind of had to stop arbitrarily here. But um, but yeah, I'll take the ESV mm -hmm. and I'll quote that word for word. And then I'll say, but with exhaustive divine determinism in mind, this is what it should say. And so I have the ED 
or the ESV version and then the <laughs> EDDV, the Ed version, the EDDV. You, you should so. patent that and make that a thing. I'm not oh, kidding. <laughs> Don't tempt me. I um, will. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to say, after I wrote that article, yeah, I felt dirty um, oh, because yeah? I saw what was really implied by this Calvinistic view. Mm. And it just writing those words out of what was implied um, by exhaustive divine determinism and applying that to scripture made me feel really dirty. And wow. uh, yeah, I just didn't like it, but I think it was a helpful, it's been very helpful to many people to really expose, wow, okay, this is what scripture says, but this is what's entailed by exhaustive divine determinism, this Calvinistic view. Mm -hmm. And you can just see, wow, this is unbiblical. This is another religion. Um, and uh, I, look, uh, in my video called Calvinism, a different gospel, I'm careful and clear to say that just because Calvinism is not Christianity, that doesn't mean that Calvinists aren't saved. I'm not making that case. In fact, I will argue that most of them probably are. Um, does that raise other questions? Yes, but we don't have time to get into that now. I just point people to that video just um barely <laughs> well that's what rc Sproul RC Sproul. Said about us. that's right that's um, right he said that we're we're barely saved due to a felicitous inconsistency and i quote him in that video and i said actually that shoe is on your foot mm -hmm. um and you know i said thank you for the charity <laughs> your grace and charity you're giving us saying hey you're, we're still we're still getting into heaven yeah but actually it's this Calvinistic view that's not compatible with scripture. It is a different religion and ultimately a different understanding of the gospel. Um, but I still do think Calvinists are saved due to a felicitous inconsistency as RC, as RC Sproul thought about me. So, you know, just real quick, I would love to have a conversation with you about that specifically sometime yeah. because I actually differ uh, depending oh, on what? that. So, Oh, really? But yeah. Yeah, wow. um, but but we can talk about that uh, either privately or or a little bit later. Yeah. Well, so. we should do both. Let's yeah, let's we should talk about it because I think it's a very important discussion. Yeah. I mean, look, the mere fact that we disagree on that mm -hmm. shows that, man, what if I'm wrong? Mm. I mean, in in the video, I show that there's definite, a uh, vast. Uh, differences between what the Calvinist means when they share the gospel and what non-Calvinist Christians mean right. uh, when they share the gospel. We right. mean different things by the same words. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm wrong about the felicitous inconsistency thing, mm -hmm. then that means one of us, one side of this debate is damned and going to hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That's right? So all of a sudden this issue isn't just some peripheral, non-important issue. It skyrockets to the top. And becomes a yeah. very important issue now. Absolutely, I don't. I'm I'm currently not where you are, and I'm like, mm, I think we're still all saved here. Whoever's mm -hmm. wrong, I think we get this felicitous inconsistency. But the mere fact that we say, "What if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong about that?" Yeah, uh, that makes this a very important issue. If yeah. I'm wrong, I'm in trouble. If they're wrong, they're in trouble. And I've made the case that they are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, one of us is wrong. We both can't be right about this. One of us is advancing. A different understanding of the gospel so, but anyway i'll say this just real quick okay. wrong or right the problem from my perspective anyway isn't necessarily wrong or right even though it leads to that my perspective on it is gospel that paul and jesus and the apostles preached versus a different gospel and we know what paul says about a different gospel yeah in hebrews yeah. 1 6 through 8. um so yeah, then, that, that's my little relations. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Galatians. I mean, Galatians. Yeah. Okay. yeah that's right. Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, that's my Paul, little, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Do you think Paul wrote Hebrews? Uh, I do. Because, I do. do uh, okay. I would, I would appeal on that subject. I would appeal to church tradition, um, mm -hmm. and, and say that, you know, they, uh, they made that claim. So I'm comfortable making it. Yeah. I guess I've, you know, I'm, I'm, it's definitely a possibility. I, mm -hmm. I think the best explanation this is a topic for an, another conversation, but oh yeah, hey, I'll say somebody. this real quick. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just say this real quick. If it wasn't Paul, I used to believe that it was Apollos, but given just it seems like the consistency 
with the early church fathers on that subject. And it's not a lot, right? There's not a lot that's talked about there Mm -hmm. uh, on that subject, but the consistency is it was Paul. So I I, I tend to lean that way. I say if it wasn't Paul, it's somebody who was talking to him. Right, right. Barnabas or Apollos or or one of those (laughs) guys. So it's it's Paul inspired, so to speak, um, even if he wasn't written by his hand. The source was Paul. (laughs) Anyway. Yeah. Um, let's get back to Israel's so, question. Yeah, yeah. I would say if scripture ever describes a situation where humans possess the opportunity to choose between at least two alternatives, each of which is compatible with that person's nature at that specific moment, mm-hmm. then uh, this person doesn't just have libertarian freedom. Uh, it's more than just the sourcehood sense. They've got this is clear that it's the strongest sense of libertarian freedom possible. The the principle of um, alternative possibilities here. Right. Uh, that's and so. Look, if you can show that one has alternative possibilities at their disposal at a specific moment, then you have demonstrated libertarian freedom. Yep. Um, and Scripture multiple times describes this. Um, you know, I've offered in, in the debate I had with James White, I appealed to First Corinthians ten thirteen, and use that as a foundation to offer a deductive argument, uh, demonstrating that Scripture implies uh libertarian freedom that scripture teaches libertarian freedom i've yeah. appealed to galatians 5 13 uh deuteronomy all over the place i mean the list goes on and on but uh not only did james white not have a response to my biblical support i have yet to hear a good response to my case that doesn't mean that a case can't be made i'm just saying hey i'm still waiting for one sure but anyway yeah i think uh i do i'll make this claim Libertarian freedom is implied by scripture just as the Trinity is, um, even though the words libertarian freedom or Trinity are not found in scripture. Number two, the idea of exhaustive divine determinism opposes scripture. It's anti-biblical. And uh, there's other reasons, just philosophical reasons uh, to reject. um, And I'd say even some scientific reasons uh, perhaps to reject um, exhaustive divine determinism. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I do think, uh, libertarian freedom is biblical. Yeah, no, those are all, all very, very good points. And, and that's, that's where I would go to. And that's what I was thinking, you know, in the beginning, whenever I was typing out that question was first Corinthians 10, 13, it's just practically it for that to make sense, libertarian mm-hmm. free, libertarian free thinking, right. Would have to be implied. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I, that's where I would go. Um, yeah. That's where but, I start. Okay. That's not. It's not my only passage of scripture. No, that's, that's right. where I always start. Yeah. So I have a whole bunch more I could use. Yeah. 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 So uh, right on it. <laughs> I, I was thinking of whether or not to tell this, um, but I was talking to an Eastern Orthodox friend of mine. I won't say any names. Uh, last night about uh, someone who says that Molinism is heretical, and I did the the mere Molinism argument argument that you was yeah. telling me about Tim. You know, do you affirm libertarian free will? And does God know everything before creation, basically, right? Yeah. And he affirm he he's he has an issue with Pap, but he still affirms the source head condition. I said, That's all you yeah. need. He's a Molinist. That's all you need. You're a he Molinist at that point. A mere Molinist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So read we, the book. we don't have to take everything Molina said. You know, it's it's no, kind of the same with I Calvinism. Don't. Right. You don't have to take everything right. John Calvin said, yeah. right? To be a five point Calvinist, you see? So well, same yeah. kind of concept. Right, right, right. But anyway, okay. So now my next question, we're, we are going to get into a little bit of philosophy because this was honestly the first time I'd ever heard this term being used and the way Israel described it, it just, I'm sitting here like matrix, bro. Like, is that yeah, right. what you're saying? Uh, God's and Josh asked a really good question at this point. So you're saying that God's mind is like a container. And so let me just ask you, uh, Tim, what exactly is idealism and what are your thoughts about our reality being analogous to quote, being in the mind of God, as well as God quote, quote unquote, dreaming, uh, whatever takes place to take place, right? Uh, God is dreaming about his creatures engaging in pedophilia, incest, murder, especially given the last of or the lust of the eyes, right? The lust of the flesh and the pride of life. None of that. Uh, the, the Greek ek right? 
is yeah. not Uke Esten is not from the father, but rather from the world. What 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 are your thoughts uh, about that? So I think this is kind of an irrelevant rabbit trail, but by idealism, mm -hmm. I simply mean that the physical world does not actually exist, at least in the manner uh, that it appears to exist. Uh, so think of the okay. matrix. You brought up the matrix. Yeah. Um, uh, when, when Neo grabs the chair and exclaims to, to Morpheus and he, he says, this isn't real. And Mo Morpheus is like, what is real Neo? <laughs> and, and later, right. you know, Neo is reminded that there is no spoon. And thus, I mean, even though it sure seems like a spoon exists, mm -hmm. Neo can hold the spoon and, and uh, you know, hit his face with the spoon if he wants to, but he's reminded that there really is no spoon. And thus, once Neo understands this and knows this to be true, yep. more than simply affirming the proposition, but Neo really knows that he knows it. At that point, Neo has the power to bend reality, physical reality, uh, what he thought was physical reality to his will, but the physical doesn't actually exist in the matrix, even though it sure seems to. So look, if, if, if Neo is careful to take his thoughts captive, then he has control super, what seems to be uh, superpowers, right? Mm, he can yeah. bend the spoon just by thinking about it. He can fly, he can do all kinds, he can dodge bullets. And that's what yeah. gives him his superpowers. Now, I love, I love thinking about, wow, could, uh, reality, as we know it, actually be like the Matrix. And could we do those types it, of things that Neo does? Well, if it were, yeah, I mean, if 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 idealism is true, if yeah. <laughs> idealism is like the Matrix, then miracles aren't a problem whatsoever, right? Right, <laughs> uh, right, just right. Different coding, right? Anyway, yeah. um, I will say this. Uh, let let me let's get away from theology. There's a growing number of physicists today who are questioning, if not rejecting, um, the existence of space and matter. And then uh, the, the, and these physicists, these scientists are affirming this view of idealism. Um, in fact, I think, it, yeah, it was uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I don't know if he affirms idealism, but he seems to be quite open uh, to the possibility that the, the universe is nothing uh, but a digital simulation or something like that. But here's the point. Okay. Um, if one objects to substance dualism, which Israel does. Um, now, I think substance dualism is probably true. I think it's the best explanation. Okay. Uh, but if one rejects substance dualism um, because of, say, the interaction problem, how does the immaterial interact with the material? How does an immaterial mind or soul move my body? right? Move my physical body. Uh, how does God, um, an, an, an immaterial thing, an immaterial right. being, uh, do anything, create a physical universe? Um, if that's some something that, you know, if that really gets somebody hung up, um, then perhaps it's not the soul or God that one should dismiss, but rather dismiss matter itself. Um, now I got to be clear. I think I've been clear enough. I'm not necessarily affirming the view of idealism because it's really hard right. for me to believe that matter does not actually exist, right? It sure feels real to me. Um, I am, however, yeah. willing to consider the data suggesting that this is a possible description of reality. Okay. And so, um, yeah, you know, for more about idealism, yeah, right, let me recommend a couple of guys. Uh, in fact, I think you've had Michael Jones on your show before, haven't you? We have. We have. Yeah. I'd love to interview yeah, him again is. on this topic because. Oh, yeah. bring him. Bring him on. Yeah. Okay. Michael Jones is an idealist. Uh, Johanan Rotz. That's R-A-A-T-Z. Rats. Uh, Rotz has a. <laughs> uh, it looks like rats. Yeah, but it's Rotz. Um, yeah, yeah. He has a degree in physics and a graduate degree in philosophy, in fact, uh, from Biola University. He, tra okay. he was trained under J.P. Moreland. Um, nice. And Moreland, I, I mean, Moreland is a substance dualist like me, but like me, Moreland has said of Rotz's work, we can't rule this out. I've seen the video of, of uh, Moreland actually talking about Johan and Rotz's work and saying, look, this is at least a, a possible explanation. We can't rule it out. And, and has really uh, given uh, Johan a, a kind of a stamp of approval. 
even though at the end of the day, Moreland is not an idealist. He's a substance dualist um, uh, or a dualist of some sort. But anyway, I believe, uh, so, I mean, that's Johan and Rods. I believe Michael Jones is almost done with his graduate degree in philosophy. I'll be okay. speaking at a conference with him here in a couple of weeks. So I'll talk to him about this, but, um, but yeah, these guys are both bright. They both, uh, have put in tons of hours upon hours upon hours working on this topic. They've both been advancing idealism, a uh, Christian idealism online uh, for close to a decade now, maybe longer. I, uh, but I've been following their work on this uh, for around a decade. So, um, like I said, uh, both Rots and Jones are both leading Christian idealists. And unlike Israel, they both affirm libertarian freedom, and moreover, they both affirm Molinism. Yeah. In fact, Johann and Rotz, uh, let me, uh, he, he wants, I'm going to, let me, uh, just one second here. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Rotz once offered this. He said, if it were proven that substance dualism, let me put my glasses just a second. If it were proven that substance dualism is false due to the interaction problem, then I should add the following premise to the free thinking argument and say substance dualism is false and conclude that space and matter are illusory and that naturalism slash physicalism is false and then conclude that God and other immaterial minds exist. In fact, this can be reformulated into a simple argument for God's existence in itself requiring only introspection to verify says, one, mental substance does not reduce to matter. Two, substance dualism is false. Three, monistic idealism entails, and thus God exists. <laughs> that's all from him. So that's that's interesting. Um, in fact, Rotz has been arguing for Molinism on scientific grounds lately. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, he's, re he's been open to Molinism for quite a while. But okay. based on his work in, in physics and science and idealism and philosophy uh he's now making a scientific case for molinism which is amazing when you think about it, because it's not the foundation of or for the arguments that i provide i mean i i make cases for molinism uh that it's the best explanation of all the biblical data i mean really at the end of the day that's why i'm a molinist is because i've rejected exhaustive divine determinism and then I try to say, okay, how can we make sense of all of scripture? And I'm like, even if there's some problems with Molinism, you know, how do you ground mental knowledge, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't think that's a huge problem, <laughs> but I'm like, okay, I don't know how you do that. But based yeah. upon all the scripture as a whole, we can reject determinism, but I've got to make sense of all of this. I'm just going to say the best explanation of the biblical data is Molinism. Yeah. Now that's the case I make. Um, it's more uh, based on a biblical foundation. In fact, that's why I debated James White. Is Molinism biblical? That was the topic. Right. What Johann and Rotz is doing is making a scientific case for Molinism. So we've got philosophical arguments for Molinism. We've got scientific arguments for Molinism, and we've got biblical arguments for Molinism. So mm. it's on pretty solid ground, even though I'm not really. I mean, people think oh, Tim is the Molinist guy. Yeah, I argue for it. I argue that it's the best explanation, but I'm really, I don't, I'm not, I don't really care. I do, I do think it's probably true. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't care if it's wrong. I'm just going to say, hey, this is what I think is true. This is why I think it. Let's yeah. keep having this conversation. I'm going to write books about it until uh, I can see that I was wrong. And if that's the case, hey, like I said earlier, I'm going to write another book right. <laughs> telling you why, why this view is, is true. Right. Um, so people are like, you're just committed to your, your, your view and your presuppositions. No, not at all. Like we talked about earlier, I'm, I'm committed to truth and that's what I want more than anything else. Amen. But I happen to think that Molinism is true. Anyway, bottom line, yeah. let me get back to this whole idealism thing. Yeah. I argue that we are non-physical souls as a substance dualist. I argue that we are non-physical souls who have physical bodies. I believe that this is actually a real physical thing that takes up space right? yeah <laughs> right it would seem but as me, though <laughs> yeah it seems that way it seems that i mean it's real. It, like neo if that's not true i'm going to really have a really hard time getting around that mm -hmm. but if it's not if it but if idealism is true i do want to eventually say oh 
wow, this is the truth. And I think there's a good case to be made. That's why I don't rule it out. I am open to it. And idealism is my fallback position. If I happen to be wrong about my body. Um, now, if these fit like, so if these physicists and philosophers are right about idealism, then we are non-physical souls who simply perceive that we have physical bodies like Neo did in the matrix. And I said, well, what's the big deal? It's still a kind of a form of substance dualism. I mean, substance dualism is you're a, you're a non-physical immaterial soul that has a body on this idealistic view. You're a non-physical immaterial soul who uh, seems like has a body. And I'm like, what's the big deal? Um, the, the key there is both those views are committed to the immaterial mind. And I think they're much stronger. I mean, we can, as my argument or my, the, the argument I advanced with JP Moreland shows me, we can rule out uh, robust naturalistic views where immaterial realities don't exist. Yeah. I mean, and even on the matrix, you still got to look both ways before you cross the street, right? Even if you know uh, there is no car, right? You'll, you can still die in the matrix, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. You still got to look both ways before you cross the street. Yeah. So um, even if it doesn't really exist anyway, although I'm quite willing to change my mind on this view, I'm not convinced that the interaction objection demonstrates that substance dualism must be false. But one way or the other, robust naturalism or physicalism or materialism, um, those views we can rule out completely. So that's all I got to say about idealism. I don't know if that helped. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. And I, I'm going to so I'm going to call a couple audibles here. Right. Um, my, my first thing is if, if seemings, right, we're talking about, well, it seems as though material is, is real. Substance dualism is real. If that turned out to be false, I would honestly, like, it doesn't seem to me at this point, like it's such a big step then to believe that for, or, or to see that free will is an illusion, right? Because that's one of the things that convinced me of the, the libertarian, you know, understanding is that you've got guys like Chris Date, Colton Carlson, right? They say it different ways, but ultimately what it boils down to is that, yeah, it seems as though I am the source of my actions when in reality it's not. If material, if the material world around us is just like that, an illusion, then for me, it's not such a big step then to say, oh, well, okay, maybe I have to check out free will again because this is an illusion. That might be an illusion. Like it's all a lie, right? It's all an illusion. Yeah. So my, my second thing is, so that's just, you know, just hearing you, uh, that that's kind of where my mind went at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. So my second thing is, uh, whenever you see Michael Jones in, in a couple of weeks, encourage him to come on faith unaltered. If you would like th throw a dog a bone on that one. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm, I've got his email and we're friends on Facebook. Uh, yeah. so I'll ask him, but I know he's a busy dude. So if oh, I yeah. can get, you know, uh, a bug in his ear like that would be that would that'd be helpful, bro. Like, do me a favor yeah, yeah. if you would. Well, he's um, he's a smart guy and doing some yes. awesome work. I would love to talk to him about this mm -hmm. this topic for sure. Um, so my third thing is, and now this is where I want to get a little theological, a little historical on, on this subject of idealism uh, in, in, in general. Here's my question, Tim. Substance dualism, it seems right. And I could be wrong on this. Uh, you might know better than me on this one. Is this the view that, well, let me just, let me ask it like this. Is there anywhere in scripture that we could go to point out that, look, substance dualism is real. Like this mm -hmm. is a biblical concept. Oh yeah. Okay. So that leads me to this then. You know how Jude talks about the faith that's once been, that's once for all been handed down. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure it's Jude. I I'm, might be Hebrews, but pretty sure it's Jude. Anyway, my question is, is that part of the faith? Is substance dualism that we have a soul, that we are a soul, that we are a body, that the two are mixed um, into one human being, right? Uh, I think Genesis teaches this, right? That we are made from the dust of the earth and God breathes his breath into us. Um, Hebrews talks about us, uh, in, in, in one sense anyway, being spirit and soul. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear people who can destroy the body, but fear God who can destroy both God or both, uh, 
soul and body right. in so, hell. You so just, I just got to jump in. Yeah, yeah. The soul and this immaterial aspect of human existence is not lost on idealism. Okay. What's lost is the real body. Is or, the or, body. Or, 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 and I don't want to say real body. I mean, okay. maybe you could say, well, what is real? Like, like Morpheus said to Neo, what is real, Neo? See, so, that's so it really comes down to this. Is ultimate reality composed of atoms and particles, or is it composed of information? Right. And that's yeah. what Israel was talking about in the video that we yeah. did with him, right? Yeah. Because so he I, would I, redefine reality. Right. I, and I want to say, look, Israel's mistake isn't appealing to idealism. Okay. It's marrying idealism to determinism, determinism. Which, which leading uh, idealists reject. <laughs> they're, they're, well, they're libertarians. So um, if, yeah, so anyway, I, I'm not, I'm not an idealist, but I'm friendly to it and I'm yeah. willing to have my mind persuaded and become an idealist. It, like I said, it's like, like I don't affirm Chris Date's view of hell, but it's my fallback position. Right. He's done right. such a good job arguing for it. Yeah. That I can't rule it out any longer. And so that's a victory for Chris. Right? Absolutely. If he, gets, if he can get me to, I used to just reject and say, it's not even on the table. But now you're thinking about it and it's a fallback. And I'm like, yeah. Great job, Chris. You've convinced me that I should right. at least put it on the table. In fact, yeah. if my current view of hell ever is destroyed, that will be my view. Right. That's my fallback view. And I, so I do the same thing with idealism here. I sure. think it's smart for Christians to, to, to rank their views, right? So I'm like, I think Molinism is the inference of the best explanation of all the data. Yeah. But if Molinism's ever destroyed, what would I do? Well, I do know what I wouldn't affirm, Calvinism. Right. right. That is right. ruled out. Right? right. So now what am I left with? Oh, I've got to look at my options here. And I'd say mm -hmm. probably some flavor. And I, and there's so many different views of open theism out there. Mm -hmm. uh, some I would outright reject, but there's some views of open theism where like, mm, may, okay, maybe I'd go with this modified uh, view here. But right. anyway, I'm going off on some rabbit trails. No, it, it, it's fine. I mean, in Eastern Orthodoxy, right, we have the same kind of thing that happens, right? So you've got some Orthodox Christians that believe in an old earth. You've got some Orthodox Christians that believe in a young earth, right? So mm -hmm. we have this concept of, okay, there's within the unity, right? There is still a little dissent. There is still a little bit of disagreement. Right. Whenever it comes to yeah. theological issues. Now, I think personally, Protestantism, and this isn't a diss to any Protestant, but I think it's more extreme in Protestantism. I don't think it's that big of a uh, whenever you compare Protestantism and orthodoxy. Right. I think you see more unity within orthodoxy than you do Protestantism. Right. Everything's argued about a Protestantism. Not everything is argued about an orthodoxy. Um, but but I guess here's my point in, in bringing that up. If substance dualism is part of the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints and by the saints to their disciples, can we honestly say that 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 the church fathers got that wrong? I mean, this is what Jude. Th this is what he said that we uh, have I, right. I, I, you see what I'm saying? Okay, Does so that make sense? I, yeah. Yeah. So okay. I would say I want to go that far with it. OK. Um, I don't think uh, scripture says substance like the. Uh, the body is made of atoms and not information. Okay. You know, it doesn't go that far. It doesn't okay. say, uh, I mean, it, but so the question is, well, what is reality quote unquote made of? Well, and, material is right. What is material? Right? Yeah. And the, I don't think the Bible talks about it. I, what I think the Bible make. I mean, what, you know, Paul is clear. Um, it's better to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. So he of believes course. that the body that, actually exists that's made of atoms and molecules mm -hmm. he, he can exist apart from that thing um or if it's made yeah. up of numbers or <laughs> and information and not well, doesn't really exist the way we think it is he can exist apart from that thing um so what he so i think what is clear here is if he can exist it's better be apart from the body and present with the lord then there is the, the thing that he refers to as i is not a physical thing but that's the thing, though, and and I don't want to get off onto this like on an idealism. We got a whole bunch to talk about, but the the reason that we are being resurrected at the end of the day or at at the end of this mm -hmm. age into you know into the next age, this is a bodily resurrection, right? Like yeah, our body is extremely important. Yeah. 
but Neo had a resurrected body too. Well, see, that's true. So, okay. All right. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Real. So, yeah. Well, I, again, I'm, I'm uh, defending the view that I don't hold. I'm just defending, I guess, why I keep it on the table and don't no. roll it out. Perfect. And, and, and that's good. I do that I'm, with evolution. I do not affirm evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I do defend those who have made a case that it's compatible with the creation account in scripture. I've argued that much in my book. Right. But I'm not an evolutionist. I don't think it's true, but right. I can show you how it's compatible. Yep. Right. So it's possibly yep. true. And people get, Oh, Tim's an evolutionist. I'm like, what? No. What did I say? Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I, I think I would be on board with that as well. Right. Because to my knowledge and now don't quote me on this, but I think there are Orthodox Christians that hold to evolution. Um, so I could be wrong about that, but um, I'm pretty sure there is. So okay. th there are Christians that hold to or Orthodox Christians anyway, that hold to old earth because of the very thing oh. that you just said. Yeah. Um, th you know, Genesis, it can be taken symbolically. It can be taken literally or it can be taken in a narrative structure way. Right. So. It just there's multiple options. I mean, Dr. Craig is. just has a whole had a whole book, the quest for the historical Adam. Yeah, uh, right. Discusses right. the stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he's right or wrong, but uh, bottom line, he's making a solid, a strong case that has to be considered. And if so. a strong right, and if a strong case can be made, then it has to be considered, in my opinion. But that's good. Yeah. All right, so let's get back to the video with Israel. So at the 19-minute mark, I want to ask you about a syllogism uh, that Israel laid out at the 19-minute mark, and, and just get your thoughts on it. So the syllogism is, and I wish I had it typed up. I don't, um, but what I can do is maybe put it in the description for if someone wants to go actually look at it. I can just copy and paste it in the description so you can see uh, what it is I'm saying at this point. But P1 uh, the nature of libertarian free will is either ordered or not ordered, an A or not A uh, premise, right? Mm -hmm. P2, premise two, the nature of libertarian free will is not not A, okay? Yes, that is a double negative, so therefore, the nature of libertarian free will is ordered, right? It is A, it is ordered. P4. The na if the nature of libertarian free will is ordered and God puts that order, then God determines human choices. And that's the conclusion. Israel actually in the video gives premise five and premise six, but it's just a repetition of premise four. So I don't know if he was looking at something and was reading the wrong line, but it's literally a restatement of premise four. So I just mm -hmm. stopped there. Um, Israel defines ordered as, quote, something that is identifiable like a pattern, i.e. observable regularity. Now, I'll just make this one statement, and this is a shot at Israel because he gave multiple shots to you <laughs> in that video. Um, but I will say, Israel, you talked about nice, long, sometimes 30, 30 pages to, to uh, define feminism, right? And your definition of ordered is really one word, a pattern. Double standard, my friend, double standard. Anyway, so what, what are your thoughts on, on Israel's premise, uh, premises there, his syllogism, uh, Tim? Well, yeah, okay, so we got to practice uh, some analytic theology here and, and carefully, de carefully define our terms. Let's do it. So I started this whole thing. J.P. Moreland and I, uh, did, we wrote that paper. An explanation yep. in defense of the free thinking argument. And so Moreland and I made sure to practice good analytic theology. I mean, he is the philosopher. I'm a theologian. We're both committed to analytic theology. Mm -hmm. um, and so we made sure to do this before we offered our deity of deception argument in our peer reviewed academic journal article. So, what does it mean for something to be determined? Well, mm -hmm. Uh, an event is determined if antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate said event. So if exhaustive divine determinism is true, then God provides the antecedent conditions to necessitate all things about humanity, including the entirety of our mental activity, uh, our thoughts, beliefs, intuitions, judgments, evaluations, deliberations, 
uh, the manner in which one experiences reasons or reasoning or responds to reasons, right? That's all, that's none of that. How I respond to a reason is not up to me. That's all determined by God, a deity mm -hmm. of deception on this view, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, let me back up. Now, what about libertarian freedom? How do I define that? Well, uh, and especially what I'm concerned with is libertarian free thinking, right. right? So I say libertarian freedom includes the ability to think such that antecedent conditions are insufficient, right? They're insufficient to necessitate one's thoughts and ensuing beliefs. Or as I've recently uh, stated, I, I've said that libertarian free thinking is the ability to carefully deliberate in order to reach rational inferences about ultimate reality, you know, metaphysics and theology. And then I've argued that carefulness, uh, this carefulness condition is incompatible with Ed, with exhaustive divine determinism. And moreover, one is either, if, if, if Ed is true, one is either determined to affirm truth or not. So there's no I don't have any powers to rationally infer uh, the truth on these things. If, you know, I, I don't have the power to rationally infer truth. If God determines me to affirm false theological beliefs, then I have zero power to infer a better or true belief on that topic. It's not up to me. So I don't, if Ed is true, there's no real inferrings of best explanations here. It's just what some other guy determines you to believe. And so, uh, if one is determined to reach their conclusions by an untrustworthy something or someone else, you know, mindless laws and events of nature or a deity of deception, then we are simply left with assumings and hopings. But assumings and hopings, uh, that's a far cry from rational inference. It's not the same thing. Now, notice that none of the relevant terms that I'm discussing here say anything about order. The word isn't there. Indeed, mm -hmm. This key word in Israel's argument, I mean, it didn't seem clearly defined to me, but may, I might have missed that. You said it came down to the word pattern. Okay, right. none of my arguments have the word pattern, and it's just irrelevant. So what is this new word introduced supposed to do to upend the argument that I've advanced uh, uh, against Ed, the, the deity of deception argument? Look, yeah. even if Israel's argument here dealing with orders and patterns was successful it does nothing to stop the advance of the deity of deception argument absolutely nothing as far as i can tell can you tell no nope. nope. okay nothing so all right so let me back up now. so yeah with that said mm -hmm. uh let's talk about the manner of understanding divine orderings because i'm gonna say well look of course i believe in divine or order here. <laughs> so in the paper that Moreland and I co-authored, we explained that God did intelligently design and fine tune and order, if you will, um, our, our truth attaining faculty. So um, let me read to you a, a section of our paper here in a second. Okay. So this is in the, uh, in the conclusion of our paper. And I wrote, Ultimately, just a second. I'm getting old. I need these things. Okay. That's why I wear them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, a person's metaphysical and theological beliefs are either one, determined by something non-rational and thus untrustworthy, two, determined by a deity of deception and thus untrustworthy, three, random and thus untrustworthy, or four, caused and determined by a by an intelligently designed free thinking agent created in the likeness of a maximally great being God with cognitive faculties functioning properly subject to no dysfunction in an appropriate environment, which can be aimed at truth. If the agent is careful and handles his or her powers responsibly, the first three options leave us with skepticism and reason to doubt our metaphysical and theological thoughts and beliefs. Option four is the best explanation and our best hope. However, the fourth option entails that one is free in a libertarian sense, not determined by something unreliable or someone who is untrustworthy. If one believes that he or she is a rational free thinker who is not ultimately mind controlled by something or someone else, 
then one should reject the, the determinism that seems to follow from both naturalism and ed. End quote. So here's the bottom line. Um, Israel offers a false dichotomy here. Our cognitive faculties are ordered, but humans have the libertarian freedom to be careful with them and to handle these God-given gifts responsibly or not. Right. So there's your opportunity to exercise um, an ability to choose between uh, different choices, each compatible with your nature at that moment. Right. I can be I can handle these carefully and be responsible with them or not. Two options. Now, as I made clear in a footnote in that paper with Moreland, I talk about training with my AR-15. And in this sense, let's see, I think it was talking about. uh I was saying, hey, look, if exhaustive divine determinism is true, then nothing ever really malfunctions. There's no such thing as real sin or real rebellion or anything malfunctioning. If mm -hmm. Ed is true, God determines all of it to happen exactly as it happens. And I right. talked about when I'm training with my Air 15, the guy that trains me is this green former Green Beret guy. And he will put these dummy rounds in my magazine and do other things to my rifle to make it not shoot. And we say... He's making it malfunction. But is it really malfunctioning? Not at all. It's it's operating perfectly when he determines it not to fire. So then, you know, when, when it, it, it appears to me as if it's malfunctioning, then I have to fix it. And, you know, in the heat of, of, uh, of battle, so to speak, I've got to take the mag out, do all the stuff, fix it, and make sure it starts working again. But did it ever really malfunction? No. Anyway, I'm off on a rabbit trip. Um <laughs> Let me talk about my uh, training with my uh, firearms again, of my AR-15 here. Um, uh, my my AR-15 is intelligently designed. It's fine-tuned and it's ordered, right? But I have the freedom to handle it in a careful and responsible manner or not. My AR-15 is ordered in such a way that if I handle it carefully and responsibly, if I practice with it, then I can hit the bullseye of a target in competition, right? Uh, similarly, my truth attaining faculties are intelligently designed, fine tuned and ordered in such a way that if I am careful, if I spend time practicing my thinking, if I am not too committed to certain presuppositions or my current views, if I am careful to bracket biases, if I handle my thinking faculties responsibly, mm -hmm. then I can, not necessarily that I will, but I can hit the target of truth. I can infer truth about metaphysics and theology um, if I'm careful, right? So anyway, I don't have to reject order here. I affirm order in a sense, but it, that doesn't mean that just because my uh, thinking and truth attaining faculties are ordered that I don't have libertarian freedom. You're going to need another argument for that. Yeah. Yeah. So if I can break this down a little bit even further and, and no, and that, that wasn't a shot at Tim or anything like that. Just, you know, if I can kind of simplify it and Tim, you correct me if I'm wrong, because I want to be able to take this to our audience and not only our audience, but people I, you know, practically engage with and help break it down as far as I can, because if <laughs> I, that's how I want it to be right. Kindergarten style it for me, baby, like let me get the, the simple definition. So what the difference between the Molinist and the Calvinist or the libertarian free thinker, right. And the determinist is the control factor, right? Because Calvinist compatibilist determinist, whatever, right. Whatever definition we're going to use there, they all will say, but Tim, I am deliberating. I am participating in that. I am doing that, right? Here's the yeah. issue. God, and this is why you keep bringing up exhaustive, defined determinism. So it seems like to me, and maybe I'm just, maybe I'm circular reasoning here or begging the question or whatever, but it seems like to me that the Calvinist, right, is simply experiencing deliberation passively. Whereas mm -hmm. the libertarian free will advocate or libertarian free thinker, they will say, no, we're not passively experiencing deliberation. We are actively engaging and controlling 
the deliberation that happens within. Does it, it, am I right to to say it like that? Oh yeah, yeah. Is it, is I, we've discussed on your show before? Yes. Um, it comes down to are you are you the driver of the ship of reason or That's are right. you a passive passenger sitting in the back seat? Right. Uh, or are you the aware. guy that's tied up tripping on LSD? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, there's three ways to understand it. You're either the you're you're either driving the ship of reason, yeah. you're tied up sitting in the back, uh, you're aware of the turns the driver is making, but you're in no uh, control of the turns the driver is making, mm -hmm. or you're tied up sitting in the back, uh, you're a passive passenger who's also tripping on acid and subjectively and incorrectly believes that he's driving the car. There you go. And that, you know, and I say that's what you're left with, uh, with the determinist who says, well, I still have guidance control, even though God determines everything. Right. Right. You're on LSD. You're on acid. You're tripping. Right. There you, you go. don't have no. control of nothing. If God could, if God determines everything, you determine nothing. There you go. And if you control mm -hmm. anything, then God does not determine everything. That's right. Period. Yeah. Subject. And what, one more. And let's point use the make. same word. We'll say yeah. if I determine anything, God doesn't determine everything. Right. And if God determines everything. I determine nothing. Right. And we believe that right. God has granted us that superpower, right, to yep. determine some things. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what it is yeah. to synergistically cooperate with God. I know Calvinists hate and, that word. Right. But it's and a here's the deal. word. Yeah. If Molinism is true, God can allow us to determine th some things and God can still predestine what we determine Ooh. by definition. Right? We can, we, okay. we can do the analysis of all of these words and I'll get all their definitions in place and show that this is something that follows by definition. Yep. Do some careful analytical theology here and we can show this. And that's what I aim to do in my book. And I've tried to clarify it even more since then. And in my second Amen. edition, it will be, clarified even more. Amen. You know, I, I just want to make one more comment about this section and then we'll move on to the next question. But you had brought up um, missing the mark, right? And in uh, from God, well, I, I don't want to say it like that, but according to God, right? And according to Calvinist, we'll say the way they get around um, God not contradicting himself, even though he does, uh, is to say, right, God decrees all things that come to pass right this is his decretive will but he also has what they call a permissive will right where yeah. the and it and and these two wills can be contradictory in the sense that well god doesn't want us to sin right but god determines us to sin so in one view right we are from the permissive will standpoint we're breaking god's law and going against his will, but from the decree of will standpoint, no, we're doing exactly what God determines us to do. We're not sinning. We're not missing the mark. We're doing exactly what God determines us to do. You know, the interesting thing about that, Tim, hmm. I have looked in the church fathers ever since I have started uh, investigating orthodoxy. And you yeah. know what the consensus is among the church fathers about God's what? will? What's that? There's only one. Oh, God between the persons of the Trinity. Now it changes up once God, uh, the son takes on human nature, right? Once he incarnates, then the consensus among the fathers and something that's declared in the sixth ecumenical council is that Jesus does have two wills, a divine and a human will. But the divine will is something that is shared. I, I think we can use that term between the three persons of the Trinity, i.e. the father doesn't have, have a separate will from the son. And the Son and the Father don't have a separate will from the Holy Spirit. They all share one will. And I find that extremely wow. interesting. And I would challenge yeah. a Calvinist to show me something else. Okay. I, all right. Let me uh, let me uh, offer a little bit of a pushback there. Yeah, sure. Um, now, look. I don't know if I have an answer, but I'm just yeah, saying. No, no I, I mean, yeah. okay. If Molinism is true, okay. then it would be true that God has a will for, uh, say, he, he had the will for uh, Joseph's brothers not to sell him into slavery. Okay. He also knew that Joseph's brothers would freely choose to sell sure. him into slavery and also knew all the good that was going to result from it. Sure. Right. So God had a will for 
uh, his brothers to love Joseph and not to sell him into slavery, mm -hmm. knowing that they wouldn't freely, not that he's gonna, going to determine them to do that. That'd be silly. Mm -hmm. um, but also had the will for it to occur since good was going to result mm -hmm. from their free, their free and evil choices. Mm -hmm. So I think there is something to say. We can analyze this and say, well, okay, we can make sense of these two different wills, but you better define it clearly. Now, I don't think the Calvinist who says that God determines everything has access to that line of reasoning. Okay. You're saying, well, God, you know, so the Molinist can say, well, God permitted something to occur. But it doesn't make the sense to say, well, God determined it and then permitted what he determined. So let me, that's, let me ask you. That's nonsense to say God determines X and he permits what he determines. What? That's silly. It's absurd. So from the Molinist perspective, would it be more like first and second order desires? Whereas in the Calvinist perspective, it would be like literal contradicting wills. Um, I don't know. I I'll have to think about that. I, I'm just okay. saying it could be God's will um, for, I mean, let's say, all right, people hate it when I do this, but it just helps to clarify because everybody's seen the movie. I don't even like Disney <laughs> anymore. I'm so close to deleting Disney plus because no, no, Dude, you're I, the Avengers guy. Come on, man. I know, right? Own but they're it. Just getting more woke all the time. They're on thin well, ice. Anyway, that's true. Anyway, yeah. So, um, but I, but I do love the uh, Infinity War and Endgame. Now, mm -hmm. Doctor Strange had the will for Thanos to repent um, and to not sure uh, snap his fingers, killing. Half of all the life in the universe. That was sure. Dr. Strange's ultimate will. But he knew that Thanos would not do that. And he knew, knew the only way to get to the best outcome where the evil of Thanos is ultimately defeated and all the uh, the saints would be raised or the Avengers would be raised um, mm -hmm. was to permit Thanos to do great evil freely. Right. And so right. Dr. Strange had two wills here. He had... He, Ultimately, he his will was for Thanos to. Uh, sorry about that. Ultimately, his will was for Thanos to uh, repent, but he knew that he would not freely choose to do so. Therefore, uh, Thanos or his will was to let to permit what Thanos was going to do, knowing that it would lead to the greatest outcome. So, I think we can make sense of those. I just don't think that as 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 mere Molinists, we can make sense of these different wills, but the Calvinist can't. If he's going to say that God determines everything and says, but he he permits some things and not other things. He permits some things that he determines, but not other things. I just don't get it. That just right. is nonsensical to me. Does it make sense to you? No, not that. Um, to, to say that he permits what he decrees. Or determines. Uh, well, well, yeah, I my apologies because there's yeah. a difference between determine and decree right right yeah, i affirm but, the decree i just say the decree is not deterministic right right of right. course um uh, and it's also not I mean, random open right? theists affirm yeah. the decree to create we would all affirm the, the decree we, yeah you're, we all affirm right. the decree in some sense right right so in determinism then you're right and i think tim and correct me if i'm wrong on this but would the key difference at this point between the Molinist and the Calvinist, then B, that knowledge for the Calvinist is causal, right? This is how God knows things because he determines them to happen. Yeah. Whereas from the Molinist perspective, it's reversed, right? God knows things, all things, all possibilities before the decree to create is actualized. Yeah, as I made clear in the debate with James White, which he never responded mm -hmm. to, if God is necessarily omnipotent and necessarily omniscient, uh, then that means he cannot help but have middle knowledge. Yeah, and God that is does omniscient not, by nature. Right. So if God is omnipotent, he can create a free creature. If God's omniscient necessarily, then he knows how the free creature would behave if he were created in a non-deterministic scenario. Mm -hmm. Therefore, 
you get your free will and your mental knowledge and you get Molinism. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a, another topic really. Right. Uh, again, right. I'm not here today to defend Molinism. I'm just, that's, right. that stuff is for free, right? We can talk about that later. I'm here to take down Bonus. determinism. There you go. There you go. All right. So let's get back to it then. Show that, That's a good, that, that's a good thought experiment though. Um, yeah. So, all right. So my next question then, Tim, and, and this is more for funsies than, than really anything. So I talked about, uh, I was bashing on Israel a little bit. He's, he, you know, he's a little firecracker. Like he will, he'll say, he'll jab, man. You know what you said earlier in the opening, like he, he'll, he'll hit back whenever he's hit. He'll swing first sometimes. And, and I'll just say that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He kind of did a few it. times. I, did. I was like, all right. I, yeah. And, and, and I might have, I, I heard a couple a couple uh, well, stiff jabs that he threw at me during the well, uh, interview that I felt were unwarranted. But I will yeah. say this, the manner in which he and I, we had a private discussion and he was very nice to me. And I was like, I'm going to let that pass. Yeah. And um, he laughed and said he was joking. Right. So right, I mean, right, right. I, I think he was kidding, even though it, was, yeah. it got a little excessive at some point. Hey, yeah, I think he said, yeah. I don't know why I'm doing this. Well, yeah, because you're determined to, bud. Like, that's why. <laughs> anyway, what, yeah. what was you going to say? No, I, I think uh, no, I think I said it earlier. Yeah. Like, for me, I I always want to come in peace. Yeah. All right. Even if I'm gonna right. look, I think I, I think your view is false, but let me come in peace to explain why. And then when I'm punched back, I'm like, hey, stop punching. And they keep swinging. I'm like, all right. I mean, I used to fight MMA. Right. I'm like, all right. Look, I didn't want to fight, but if you want to fight, I'm gonna fight right. with truth. I'm not going to back down. Right. right, 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 right. Right. And, uh, but man, I think it's important for us to come in peace mm -hmm. and strive for peace and then look and, and to be quick to forgive. I mean, if somebody's a jerk to me. Yeah. Right. And, and I've experienced this lately, even with some Calvinists um, and some non Calvinists. But uh, one guy came to me after being a jerk to me for a long time and he said, Tim, I've been in sin. Mm. Will you please forgive me? Mm. And something I've taught for a long time, even when I was a youth pastor, I said, be quick to forgive. Mm. And I, I will make sure if, if somebody apologizes to me, I will uh, forgive them on the spot. Mm -hmm. God's done that. God does that for us. We better follow his lead. Right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't hold grudges. I'm not going to hold a grudge either. That doesn't mean I will. So somebody might have to work a little bit for me to trust them. Like as a brother, I'd go to war with. Or, yeah. You know, I'd, you fight next to his side. Right. But I'm not going to hold something against him anymore. Now, and, uh, yeah. Let me ask you this. So, mm -hmm. just as a bonus, right? Do you forgive? So, say I offend you, right? Do you forgive me before? So, say say I offend you, and then you don't hear from me in a month. Do, yeah. Have you already forgiven me, or do you forgive well, me once I question. come seeking? Uh, mm -hmm. repentance. No. Well, I mean, sometimes look, I'll say there's sometimes when I haven't worked through it enough to get to the point where I've said, okay, I forgive that person, even if they never asked for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. But if I haven't worked through it, because sometimes it's hand over fist and you got to work through. I, mean, I agree. Hurt bad by some people in the past of that I've forgiven. Right. But it, I mean, I had to work through it with one guy for years. I had to, he never apologized to me ever. Uh, he eventually died, but before he died, I had worked through it in my heart to where I forgave him. We became Facebook friends and we That's actually awesome. encouraged each other and we ended on good terms. Yeah. <laughs> um, the reason I asked that is because I, I'm sure you remember Dale, uh, our co-host that he stepped down. Uh, now he's focusing on other things, but we're going to do an episode this Friday about that very topic. So Dale would say that, no, we do. The biblical precedent is that we do not forgive until the person comes seeking uh, repentance. Oh, okay. And so that, I, that, I, I, I disagree, but, but yes, and look, yeah. it, it, it was so good for me with this guy that I just mentioned in mind. Yeah. Uh, I, I forgave him even though he never asked. Right. But right. we ended on good terms and, but me forgiving him mm -hmm. uh, was so good for my soul. Yeah. It was good for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of selfish. To forgive somebody, if you think about it well, in that weird way, but but it also then allowed us, even though he never said, "Tim, I am sorry." Yep, it allowed us to start talking again and building a friendship. And uh, you know, when he died, I felt 
I didn't feel like, oh, this is something I'm going to be carrying around for a lot longer. Now, I'll say this. There's sometimes when I found myself really mad at somebody, or they've hurt me really bad. And then, in fact, this just happened last week. And this guy's, I'm like, what? This guy's being a jerk. And then all of a sudden he's like, Tim, I'm sorry. Now, at that point, I haven't even had a chance to process everything. But as soon as I hear, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Boom. Forgiven. Done. Mm -hmm. I don't have to process. Right? I forgive you. Let's go mm -hmm. forward together. Let's honor Christ together. That's my right. That's how I that's how I try to live. <laughs> yeah. And I'm well, sure Roman yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was yeah. I was just gonna say Romans twelve eighteen, right? It says if possible, if it's possible, yeah, as much as it is Depends up to you, you. Yeah, right? Yeah. Live peaceably with all men. Ooh. Now I think well, you can forgive absolutely. somebody. Go ahead. That's anti-determinism. As far as it depends on you. Oh, not God. I mean, otherwise we say, hey, God, you determine some of us to live uh, with each other, uh, peaceably with each other or not. No, yeah. as far as it depends on you. You. You make sure yeah. that you live peaceably with everybody. As far as it depends on you. Good catch. Libertarian freedom. Wow. Good catch. I wasn't even thinking that. I was thinking, you know, we forgive. Now, we can't necessarily reconcile until someone, you know, the person that offends us right. comes to us and seeking that reconciliation, yes. but yes, we can yes. forgive. That's right. And that this gets us into salvation issues. Yes. God's love is perfect. He's always, I mean, he he's already paid the price. The cross was enough. Jesus paid it all. He loves everybody. And for reconciliation, for heaven to occur, a marriage with your creator, as the as Jesus makes clear in the parable of the prodigal son, the son had to come to his own senses, repent, turn around and come back. And the father ran toward him, yep. ran toward him. He already and Jesus him. is talking about God's love for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and you'll see the father never gave his son irresistible grace. The father never zapped him or did anything else. The father let him go. Yep. But for true love to occur, it has to be done freely. And the son freely came back and they were reunited. And that's how it is for us. God has already forgiven us. But for everybody to experience that, the love that comes from that forgiveness, we have to, it takes two, it takes two to make a thing go right. That's right. Oh, That's I right. start dancing. Don't make me start dancing. It takes two to tango. I bet you won't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get so let's get to uh uh the definition that I would like to ask you to define for us, Tim. Um, can you give us a more robust definition of deception? Something other than to deceive someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he didn't like my uh my Google. Uh, my that screenshot I showed. He did not like that picture at no, all. No, and and I gotta I gotta tell you, look, go back and read what I wrote. That three thousand word response. My case had nothing to do. I don't even think I referenced that picture. No, I just no, it was it just on there. Yeah. yeah, but can I right. say this real quick before before yeah. you get to your answer? However, I don't think you need a thirty page essay to define what a sandwich is okay yeah i'm just gonna say that up front like if you can't define what a sandwich is in a sentence or less like you're overthinking it so i think some of these things can be overthought right and it's just mm -hmm. extreme to say something like that which israel did it it wasn't a sandwich it was 30 page definition uh for what feminism was and feminism wasn't even defined in there but if you need 30 pages to do that like something's wrong, I think. Deception mm -hmm. is, it, it's simple. Causing yeah. someone to believe that which is false, but I'll let you define mm -hmm. it. So, yeah. Good. So, I just let me say, because he spent a lot of time uh, complaining about the, the screenshot. Yeah. But my case was not based upon the screenshot at all. You can read through the entire thing and disregard the, that image. Nothing right. changes from my case. So, sure. all of Israel's complaints about the screenshot were misplaced and irrelevant. I just include, I'll tell you why I included it. Mm -hmm. um, I included it as frosting on the cake, as it were, because uh, Israel was talking about a colloquial understanding of what it means to be deceived. Yeah. And that this Everyday understanding, yeah. 
Yeah. And his understanding, he says, oh, well, that just entails coercion. And I was like, well, not so fast. Not at all. I, I, so I Googled deception. I'm like, oh, we're talking a colloquial case here. Mm-hmm. What's the first thing that popped up? First thing that popped up, I screenshot, I share it in the article. Yep. And, and I don't even, again, I'm going to say, I don't think that was a good definition because it used the word uh, to deceive when trying right. to, but that's the colloquial that that's number the first thing that popped up and said nothing yeah. about coercion nothing. here. And then, in fact, Tyler, uh, you went on to provide the Merriam Webster definition. You looked it up at during sure. your interview, yep. uh, you know, in, in real time, so to speak. Yep. And uh, and you said, hey, this ha- says nothing about coercion either. And if I remember correctly, Israel then rejected that definition. Now, I just got to say that, that he seems, did. Yeah, that seems ad hoc. To me yep. all right he wrote he it down off, and then said nope i i reject it go ahead yeah so so he's starting with a specific understanding of deception rejects the definitions i've offered and then when faced with the typical manner deception is defined colloquially which opposes his assertions then he simply waves it away he simply chooses to reject it because it supports my view and not his and i would say that ad hoc thinking is not typically careful thinking um or so it seems to me now now let's get back to this uh one well-known philosopher once told me that there are no official definitions in philosophy so i am free to define my terms and israel is free to define to find to define uh the same words differently my case however is not dependent upon the word deception it Mm. depends on the concept of uh, and, and I've explained what, uh, you know, okay, so it, it's it's a concept of being uh, the, the, idea, the idea that God is making all of his followers think wrongly about theological matters. I have explained why it's fair to refer to that concept as deception. Mm-hmm. But one can call this concept whatever they'd like because a rose by any, by any other name smells just as sweet, or in this case, a skunk by any other name still smells just as putrid. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it smells really bad. And as I've made clear, deception is deception if coercion is involved or not. And I've said nothing about coercion. My argument does not even imply or entail or necessitate coercion. Nope. Coercion is irrelevant and doesn't even slow the progress of my argument down. I simply noted that if a deity intentionally uses, he doesn't like the word, the fact that I said uses either now. Um, but, but I simply said back then, and I can, I don't even have to use that word. Uh, but back then I said, uh, that a deity, if a, if a deity intentionally uses his power to determine and necessitate your false beliefs about ultimate reality, uh, then it's fair to say that at best, this being is an untrustworthy source of important beliefs and at worst it's fair to call this uh being a deity of deception but bottom line whatever words you use like i said a skunk is is gonna uh, a skunk by any other name is gonna smell just as uh putrid it's gonna be just as bad uh bottom line you're still determined to affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality by this being Mm -hmm. and then as soon as you're going to say, yeah, this being, this deity determines all of his followers to get things about ultimate reality wrong. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to say that this same being who necessitates all of this confusion among his elect and necessitates all of their false theological beliefs. Well, this guy, this being, he also inspired an entire book that is supposed to tell us the truth about ultimate reality. And I'm like, that doesn't work. Why should you trust that book? If you're admitting that the same author has really good reasons to deceive us all, all the time. I mean, the Bible is clear. The Bible's clear that God is not a God of confusion. First Corinthians 14, 33, I think. Uh, The Bible is clear that God is not a God of confusion. But according to the Ed Calvinist, God is the determiner of confusion. By definition, if God determines all things, and then he say, oh, look, all these dis- uh, all these Christians are confused and disagreeing with each other. And then you're going to say, oh, OK, yeah, Scripture says that God is not the God of confusion. But according to Ed Calvinism, he is the determiner of confusion. But, hey, those are di- those are two different things. I'm like, right. come on. He's um, not a God so, of confusion, but the author of confusion, uh, the, at least the determiner of right. confusion. Right now here. Here's the point not to be missed. 
Yeah. Even if this supernatural being has morally sufficient reasons to deceive all of his followers, including Israel, why should we trust a book he wrote? For all we know, he's got morally sufficient reasons to determine all of his followers, including Israel, to affirm false theological beliefs. And for all we know, he's got morally sufficient reasons to deceive us, all of us, including Israel, with the words written in the Bible. And so this, look, you, you can't start there. This is, ironically, why Ed, why exhaustive divine determinism is not compatible with presuppositional apologetics. So I got to say, sorry, Eli, Ayala. <laughs> I mean, so Eli, a dear friend, I love this guy. Yeah. And I think he's kind of right. I love his work on presuppositional apologetics. Mm -hmm. He's actually kind of gotten me to be more friendly with presuppositional apologetics. Great job, Eli. Great job. Great work. Keep it up. What I'm showing, though, is you cannot marry those two together. Ed, exhaustive divine determinism, which he wants to affirm is not compatible with presuppositional apologetics, which he wants to affirm. You can't start with a deity of deception if you're a pre-supper. <laughs> pre-supper, pre-dinner, pre-breakfast, or whatever. Um, <laughs> Tomato, <you> tomato. <laughs> you can't start with a deity of deception if you're a presuppositional apologist. You have to start with a maximally great God, a God of truth, who desires all people to know the truth, just as it says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, right? But if God has morally sufficient reasons to deceive us all, we have reason to doubt uh, that verse in the Bible, along with every verse found in the Bible. Uh, this is a low view of God, even if it's not an attack against his uh, character, it's still a low view of God. And then it's a low, I mean, exhaustive divine determinism then is not just a low view of God, it's a low view of his image bearers because we're puppets, not agents. And ultimately it's a low view of God's word. You can't even trust a single word in it because maybe he's got morally sufficient reasons to author it in such a way that it gives us false beliefs about ultimate reality for our benefit. But either way, you're still confused deceived and you'd have no idea what's true including if calvinism's true this is why right. i say that ed calvinism is not christianity it's literally right. a different religion even though i do say i still think uh calvinists are saved and you might disagree but that's another conversation now look sure i don't don't take that to me when i say that calvinism is not christianity i'm not trying to be a jerk i apologize if I'm coming across that way, I get a little excited. I know. Um, we all do. Yeah, right. I, I get amped up. I, I, mm, sorry. I know I know. there's things about me that I'm trying to change. Um, man, I watched the James White debate, and I think my arguments were rock solid. And the content, yeah. as far as the content goes, I, I think uh, I think Molinism won the debate. Um, but I watched my body language, and oh. Just, I was ashamed. Um, could have been better. And so yeah. I, it could have been better. That's an understatement. Um, now, if Try I'm going to nice. lose, toe the line. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Everybody knows it. I knew it. I, you know, as soon as uh, the debate was over, we were on stage together and I was like, dude, I offered all these arguments. He never touched it. I'm like, I, I totally won that thing. And then right. I walked off the stage and Tyson James was there and he's like, uh, yeah, your arguments were good. You don't look very good. I'm like, what are you talking about? And and right. so we went out to eat, you know, after I did all, all the autographs and stuff afterwards and had yeah, good yeah. conversations. Really love the fact that there were some people on that were formerly for James White and they came over and they're like, yeah, I think you won. You know, nice. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Nice. Um, but um, uh, we left the church in Houston. Mm -hmm. We're driving to this uh, Chinese place, uh, Tyson and Micah Kunkel and bunch of our friends yeah and uh tyson's uh, he he says uh, get that get the video on your phone and watch yourself during the cross-examination yeah and i was like i had no idea that i looked that bad <sighs> and uh and so anyway i'm go going off on another rabbit trail here yeah uh again the nature of interviews but um hey it just shows yeah. we're not robots right right <laughs> well <laughs> yeah, that's right. Told you and I watched thus, that video you did. And Good. thus I win where it shows that I wasn't being determined, you know, like you. a robot. Um, no, anyway, I'm just saying, here's my point. 
when I say that Calvinism is not Christianity, I know I might look like I'm trying to be mean. I'm not. I don't want to come across that way. I'm, I, I believe this is true. And since yeah. I love you, <laughs> Calvinist listening, I love you and I care about you. And as you mentioned, this might be a salvation issue. Wow. This is a very important issue at this point. Um, and so since I believe this is true, it's just like the person, the atheist, uh, who's that, uh, uh, man, who's that illusionist from Vegas? Who's an atheist pen. Oh, uh, um, yeah. So, pen, uh, pen Gillette. Yeah. 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 He's an atheist and he's like, Hey, if you're a Christian, you better be sharing the gospel with me. If you think that's true and you think my eternal salvation is on the line, you better share the gospel with me. That's and if right. you don't, how much do you hate me? You know, I was like, wow. I, okay. Now look, he's saying, if you really believe this is true and you better talk to me about it. And look, I really believe this is true. Mm -hmm. It could be wrong. Sometimes I hope I'm wrong. But I, I really believe this is true, and that's why I'm trying to advance this um, and, and have this conversation. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm not trying to fight. Anyway, with all that said, let me get back to the deity of deception being trustworthy. Yeah. In a sense, as I explained to Colton earlier, if Ed is true, then God is trustworthy. What's he trustworthy to do? If Ed is true, God is trustworthy to determine you to hold false theological beliefs. And this is another way of saying that if Ed is true, then God cannot be trusted to always determine you to think correctly about these important theological matters. Therefore, you have reason to doubt your theological view if you're committed to Ed, which is a theological view. So you've got reason to doubt that itself. Right. And that's really good reason to break up with Ed. Keep your Calvinism just... You can modify it to be closer to Molinism, um, but you got to break up with Ed because, as we've said earlier today, Ed is not found in Scripture. Ed actually opposes Scripture. Ed is philosophically bankrupt. Ed is epistemologically untenable, and we can go on and on, but you yeah. must reject Ed. It's a low view of God. It's unbiblical, and it leads to epistemic meltdown. So, I don't know. What do you think? I'll say this. If there are good reasons for God to deceive us, that just gives us another good reason not to trust him. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, it's as simple as that. Like you, It's like they're saying at that point, he does it, and not only does he do it, there's good reasons for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's a good reason for me to believe something that something false, then I need to question everything I believe if I'm determined to, right? Yeah. Because I can't, I don't control that ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, but that just gives us another good reason, I think, not to trust a deity of deception yeah, <laughs> you would think they would say, no, there's no good reason for, for doing that because you don't do that. Right. But there you go. Anyway. Yeah. OK, so that that's just my thoughts on it. But um, OK, so now I want to fast forward a little bit down the road and, and we still got to get to Josh's questions. And I'm I'm going to. So I might lack a little bit more on commentary and just yeah, stick with cool. questions at this point. I'll, I'll um, try to start going through them a little quicker and try not to no, go on so many rabbit trails. Well, I, I think regardless, because you're still tying those rabbit trails back in, you know, in, 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 yeah. in some senses anyway. Um, so I think this is really, really good conversation. I think Josh is going to be extremely pleased with this conversation uh, as I know I am. And it just, it, like you just said a couple minutes ago, what we want to do is help further that conversation. Even if we're going to have, people that disagree with us and we're going to disagree with people right calvinists on this subject mm -hmm. we seek if if we have to disagree then we seek to do that without being disagreeable right and yeah. so and to give as much information as we possibly can and so i think mm -hmm. this is good um cool. but all right so about so let's fast forward in the video to the one hour and 19 minute mark and the reason i'm i'm giving everyone uh, the, these timestamps. So go back and look for this yourself. We're not trying to misrepresent Israel. We're not trying to be mean. We're trying to accurately represent his position and, and 
tell y'all what we think about it, right? And so at the one hour 19 mark, Josh, my co-host, asked Israel if Israel's experience, that's key, keep that in mind, experience of being isolated from everything else, right, is what makes him a person. Is this what personhood is? Your experience of being isolated from everything, right? Israel affirms this. Now, in our discussions of control that we have, we've all had, and, and I think you and I have even had a, a couple conversations about that, we have used analogies involving the captain of a ship actively controlling the ship or the captain being tied up and passively experiencing everything that happens while on the ship or the third option, the guy being tied up tripping on LSD thinking he's not <laughs> tied up and yeah. in control when he's not by affirming experiential agency. So here's my question. By affirming experiential agency, is not Israel affirming at the same time that when it comes to the decisions he makes, he is the captain who is tied up and passively experiencing whatever happens to him and through him? Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Um, this all comes down to what C.S. Lewis said in 1947. He says, reasoning doesn't happen to us. We do it. Right. So he's trying to say, look, there's a difference here. This is, we're not passive. We're not passive cogs who are merely experiencing the sensation of reason. No, you're doing it. And this that that one sentence of C.S. Lewis is what sparked uh, the whole uh, different ways of understanding human agency when it comes to reasoning nice. uh, that I've already you know, we've already talked about it earlier. Uh, you know, are you driving the ship of reason? Or are you a passive passenger merely aware of how somebody else is driving? Or are you tripping on acid, tied up in the back seat, and think you're driving? You're you're still experiencing the sensation of driving. You really believe you're driving, but you're not. Mm -hmm. All right. So your mere experiences here uh, are irrelevant. You're either driving or you're not, even if you're experiencing something different. So um yeah, so C.S. Lewis really started this whole thing with his argument from reason, which the free thinking argument is a version of, or it's at least sure. related to. I say that the free thinking, that I stand on the shoulders of giants like C.S. Lewis and others before me uh, when I offer these arguments. Um, uh, which, by the way, I'm working, uh, working on a book with several other scholars right now advancing mm. Uh, the work of C.S. Lewis. So that'll be out in, uh, namely, uh, The Argument from Reason. But uh, that'll be out in 2024, most likely. But nice. um, yeah, you know, we've already discussed a little bit, you know, I kind of flew over it earlier. Yeah. Let me go through these three ways of understanding agency, human agency. I say an agent is an active driver behind the steering wheel and driving the ship of reason, right? We affirm that. That's what, that's what, is the case if you have libertarian freedom. You're a libertarian free driver and you're not being driven by something or someone else. You're the driver, right? So this means that the manner in which an agent reasons is determined not by something or somebody else, but by the agent, right? The agent is genuinely in control of the steering wheel, the accelerator, and the brakes of deliberation. Uh, while thinking things through, uh, while deliberating, the agent has the power to decide if he will swerve to the left, turn to the right, keep going straight, step on the gas, uh, tap on the brakes, um, or ultimately pull that emergency brake and do a 180 degree turn and then hit the brights just to be careful and to see if he'd previously missed something along the way. There's that carefulness condition. Mm -hmm. So the manner in which the agent reasons is determined by the agent, by the driver. Because he is behind the controls of reason and he's not being controlled, determined, or driven by something or someone else. This agent, created in the image of God, possesses the libertarian freedom to think, reason, and deliberate. Now, if one's going to reject libertarian freedom, if one's going to say, if one's going to reject the libertarian freedom to steer the ship of reason, then one is left with the uh, following options. First, you got to say, well, what's driving? Right? If you're going to say, nope, I'm not driving, something or somebody else is, okay, what is it? And is it trustworthy? All right. Now, I've shown no. why both uh, the mindless 
uh, laws and events of nature are untrustworthy. And I've shown why, even if God's doing it for great reasons, he's still untrustworthy. Mm-hmm. Right? So if you can't trust the driver, then you're in trouble. Now, here's the second way to understand agency when it comes to deliberation and reasoning. Can I clarify a- something just real quick, yeah, Tim? I'm sorry. Ahead. I don't mean to interrupt. Whenever we say driving, are we talking about in an ultimate sense? Because I know the Calvinist will say, but I am driving, but just secondary causation like, right? Well, it, again, an, causation is so you get, we're just, we're not just talking about causation here. We're talking about determinism, right? Determined okay. and determined is different than cause. If an event is determined, it's cause, but not all causes are deterministic. So, okay. You, you pay attention when you, and, and actually you guys in your conversation with Israel, it went from determinism to all this other causation talk. Right. And I, I what I listened to it, I was just like, guys, somebody bring it back. It's, it's irrelevant here. Um, I affirm, in a sense, as a Molinist, that in some senses, God does cause everything. Because obviously, okay. even though I have libertarian freedom to choose, my libertarian free choice is contingent upon the fact that God caused and created the universe. Now we get into Kalam talk, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the Kalam and the free thinking argument are, are related in, in some senses because a lot of it has to do with uh, causation. But the free thinking argument is against a specific kind of causation. Now, I believe that God determined the universe to exist, right? right? Causally determined. Mm-hmm. But even though in some senses I can still affirm that God causes my libertarian free choices, it's impossible by definition for God to determine my libertarian free choices. So there's right. two different things. Anyway, you pay attention to key words, uh, the, the key words that are the focus of this discussion. And when those words are replaced with something else, you say, not so fast. Get it back on track and and get it. Are, are you talking about determined here? Mm-hmm. And then you start that conversation again. Now, let, let's get back. So when I'm talking about driver, I mean that I am determining the manner in which I think mm-hmm. because God's given me the power to be able to do that. Okay. So did God cause me to have the power to be able to be a free thinker in a yes. libertarian sense? Yes. That's yes. contingent upon God's uh, supernatural giftings that he's given me. Sure. Right. Uh, so it's, I'm not some autonomous creature, you know, the, depending on how you mean autonomous. Right. But God has created me in his image and likeness, granting me the supernatural power to be able to drive the ship of reason. Okay. Now, if I'm driving the ship of reason, that means something or someone else is not driving me. Right. That's what I mean by drive. Now, gotcha. I talked about the first way to understand agency, and that's a libertarian sense. If some somebody's going to say, no, you don't have libertarian freedom, you're not the actual driver, then what are you as an agent? First of all, you got the problem of what's driving. That's a problem. But secondly, what are you as an agent? Well, then you've got two options. An agent is a passive passenger tied up, gagged, and sitting in the back seat, merely along for the ride, who might be passively aware, but with no active power to steer the ship of reason. Mm-hmm. So if all things are determined by something or someone else, then the agent is not driving the ship of reason. No reasoning, or I should say reasoning is happening to him, Mm -hmm. as C.S. Lewis described, but he is not doing the reasoning. He's experiencing it as a passive cog, but he is not an active agent. And now sure, the agent, the the passive cog who's tied up in the back seat is aware, might be aware of the turns the driver is making, Mm -hmm. but none of these turns are up to or determined by the passive passenger. So this is why I say mere awareness. You can talk about awareness and complexity and all this kind of, you know, mere mere awareness is not sufficient to be in control of the ship of reason. It's like when I'm in an airplane, um, I'm aware of, you know, I can look out the window. I'm aware of a lot of things that are going on. I'm not piloting the ship. Right. Right. So mere awareness is not sufficient to be in control of the ship of reason. Okay. Now the passenger, the passive passenger might be aware of the turns the driver makes. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm aware of the turns that the pilot is making on the airplane. Right. But the passive passenger might, the passive passenger might even be able to recount the turns the driver made and recount how the driver got them to their destination. But that, 
that doesn't give you any control over how you arrived at their des- at the destination. And you don't even know if you arrived at the correct destination. That's the problem. So mere awareness is not enough for rational responsibility. Now, okay. here's the third option, which is kind of funny. You know, the final option describes those who affirm that all mental uh, actions are determined by something or someone else, but somehow they've still got this guidance control, you see, of, of or over their thoughts. And I'm, and I say that is just diluted. Uh, guidance control for it to work requires at least a little bit, a flicker of libertarian flicker freedom. Flicker of freedom, yep. Mm-hmm. Which the Ed Calvinist must reject. So right. here's the third option. An agent is a diluted passive passenger tied up, gagged, and sitting in the back seat who is also tripping on acid and subjectively and incorrectly believes they're behind the steering wheel and driving the ship of reason. That's like somebody in the back of an airplane tripping on acid thinking, I, I'm actually the pilot of this thing. I've got the guidance control of this airplane. Like, no, you don't, brother. Uh, you're, you're deluded. You're yes. So, so, uh, so this describes the determinist who affirms that something or someone else necessitates all things, including the entirety of their mental actions, but who still claims to have guidance control. And this mm-hmm. is obviously absurd. Now, I say the first option entails the libertarian freedom to think, reason, and deliberate, but options two and three are entailed by determinism. And so with that in mind, between those three options, I say choose wisely if you have the power and the freedom to do so. Yeah. So if that's not determined by something or someone else, choose the best explanation among those three. That's right. That's right. That So thank you for that explanation and the audible that I called there. Um, I, yeah. I, I appreciate that. And you're right. Whenever we have these conversations, we don't need to get caught up in all the synonyms, right? And I say that with air quotes. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between determine and cause and decree, right? So mm-hmm. keep that in mind if you're having a conversation with a Calvinist about this subject. Determinism yeah. is determinism. Oh. Yeah, it drives me nuts when Good. you're having a oh, man, this happens on when I'm on Twitter debating with these they're, uh, they're, I mean, they're 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 laymen who fancy themselves as theologians and philosophers, um, armchair theologians. Not, right. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, I started right. out that way, but just practice some humility here. Yeah, I, I need to do the same thing, even though I've got a PhD. Yeah, uh, yeah. but it's just, I mean, and you continue to call out the mis- you're talking about determinism, and then they start talking about decree, for example. And I'm like, well, well, hold on a second. Don't be so slippery. Mm-hmm. We're talking about determinism. And now you, I've shown the problems with determinism. And now you start talking about decree and you slip that in instead. And I'm like, dude, I affirm the decree. Open theists affirm a decree in a sense. Uh, let's get back to determinism here. Yeah. Um, so it just drives me nuts. I'm glad you pointed that out. Absolutely. All right. So now we went from the hour mark. So I'm now I'm going to back up a little bit uh, because I think these two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, especially with the way Israel describes um, why personhood can't be described as algorithmic. So at the 4615 mark, 46 minutes, 15 seconds, Israel tells Josh that Josh hasn't provided a reason or an argument for why personhood cannot be described as algorithmic. Now, my question to you, Tim, Do you believe this is a good way to describe personhood? Is this a good characteristic? Is this a good, um, I'm blanking, but is is this a good way to do it? Uh, If not, why not? Well, I mean, first, I mean, just first thing off the top of my head, that's what separates uh, humans from robots. Robots and computers do operate. In fact, if you want to see uh, a great discussion on this, Okay. Um, I actually debated chat GPT um, and you can see this on my YouTube channel. It's kind of funny because I say it's a a, a debate with a robot and um, the actual words that were uh, written by chat GPT in our debate are then given to this robot who is like, he talks about indirect, doxastic, (laughs) voluntary, you know, I mean, it's pretty funny, but it's, Did it's did you do the robot voice? Well, I did, but then they put an effect on the voice to make it sound more robotic. So nice. Yeah, we, we had some fun with it. But nice. um, here, the the AI, the artificially intelligent robot, whatever, um, 
does show these differences between humans and computers and robots and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, basically, it comes down to, hey, the, these things are determined by algorithms and preset programs. Humans aren't. Humans have indirect doxastic voluntarism, which the AI uh, was clear. If, if a human has indirect doxastic voluntarism and has indirect control over their beliefs, then that is what separates uh, humanity from uh, these computers and these robots and these yeah. things determined by al algorithms. Yeah. So that's number one. Um, but if it's necessary for a, for a person, for personhood to entail an algorithm, you know, the second issue I'd raise is, well, what about the three persons of the Trinity? Are they algorithms? And if so, who programmed them? I mean, we like uh, James right. White is going to say, who dealt those cards? Okay, well, that's not what we mean by that. But seriously, where did this algorithm come from? Right. Um, is God going to program his own algorithm? That's a good point, actually. No, right, right. So, um, so, well, and I'd say, and if God mm -hmm. is determined by an algorithm, then so much for omnipotence. There's a third problem. God cannot do all things if an algorithm determines him to only do one thing. And so that wouldn't be omnipotence. That's unipotence, unipotence, I guess. And God's <laughs> contingent on the algorithm at that point. Yes. So he's not, uh, I'll say, the, right? The three persons of the Trinity would be determined by this algorithm. I'm going to so, worship the algorithm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but you got to see, though, that, that God's not omnipotent right. on this view. That's true. Um, so what's essential for personhood is agency. As we've just, you know, I've already talked about what it means to be an agent. That's right. So we're talking about agency, not algorithms. If you're determined by an algorithm, you're not an agent. If you're an agent, you're not determined by an algorithm. Um, but as we've discussed, a robust view of agency requires libertarian freedom. Now, interestingly, the, the, the Kalam cosmological argument, um, to shift gears here, but for good reason, uh, the Kalam actually shows what's required for personhood. Okay. And you can, you can, the, the rational inferences from the Kalam's deductive conclusion uh, show that we can abductively infer that the cause and creator of the universe was a personal being. Why? Because it's got libertarian freedom and not determined by something or someone else. Mm -hmm. It can choose in a timeless state where things aren't happening one after another. It has the freedom to choose to create or not to create, right? It can uh, spontaneously, if you will, uh, not there's not falling dominoes or any other antecedent conditions that necessitate the cause and creator to create the universe or not. Right. And so if this is the case, then it's a person who can make free choice decisions <laughs> in yeah. a libertarian sense. So, um, so yeah, look, if we're created in the image and likeness of God or the cause and creator of the universe that the Kalam uh, uh, demonstrates, Mm -hmm. then it stands to reason that we have similar powers too. And libertarian freedom is a communicable attribute, right? God has the libertarian freedom. That is, he can make choices that aren't determined by something or someone else uh, other than him, right? He is the, the the determiner. And so God's got this libertarian freedom. He's at least the source. And I would argue has at times uh, uh, options, multiple options, alternative options, each compatible with his nature at a specific moment. Um, divine moment, whatever. Uh, but I would say then libertarian freedom is a communicable attribute, just like power, just like love, just like knowledge, right? Uh, God can create his creatures in his likeness with libertarian freedom. And of course he would want to do this because as I've argued, uh, uh, that allows for the best kind of love that allows for relationships with rational creatures. Yeah. Um, who can know things, you know, about theology. Uh, so it makes good sense that God would want to give us libertarian freedom, even though it also opens the door to horrendous evils. But a God with middle knowledge knows that it's worth uh, the end game. The end game is worth uh, all this evil, just like Dr. Strange knew. Don't get me started. But really, I discuss these concepts in my book, Human Freedom, Divine Knowledge, and Mere Molinism. So I encourage people to go there. Absolutely. And we'll put a link uh, in the description to the Amazon uh, link where you can buy Tim's book. Uh, do you sell it also on your website, Tim? Or does uh, it just link to Amazon no. at that point? Yeah, I mean, okay. like so many articles that I write, I uh, 
I reference it and I tag it whenever I do. So I'll, you know, if you see, see a, a blog article, yeah. website article with uh, that title highlighted, you can click on it and it'll take you to Amazon. But okay. I'll also link it in. The I should probably put it. Now that you say that I should, I should do that. We do have a swag store, a merch store that you Dude. can buy. Put FTM your, gear from, and I don't even think I have my book on there. So I, I didn't even think about that. Put so your you. book on there and cut yeah. out that middleman. So, <laughs> all right. So Josh actually had some questions, and now I we'll, we'll get into them um, as well. And and Tim, if you have to go at any time, just let me know, and we can we can cut off. Uh, I I'm I'll probably got, I can probably give you another half hour. Okay, perfect. Let's see what perfect. we can do. Yeah. All right, let's do it then. So Josh, his first question is: Do you think? Uh, a rising levels of complex awareness is a, is a sufficient definition for personhood. Uh, okay, Com complex awareness, uh, rising levels. Okay. A rising no. levels of complex awareness, yeah. like being aware that you're aware that you're no. aware. Okay, so no, I mean okay. I'm still a person when I'm sleeping. Mm -hmm. uh, a yeah. baby is still a person, right? I mean, is, is that answering the question? <laughs> I mean, I if so. we're gonna. If that is a necessary and sufficient uh, aspect of personhood, then abortion's okay. You know, and I don't think we want to go there. We don't. No, we don't. So, so I would say a properly functioning person will, uh, you know, it ha has the capacity. So a, a, a preborn infant, a preborn human yeah. does have the capacity to be aware of awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, a properly functioning person will have rising levels of complex awareness. Yeah. But as I noted above, uh, being aware, uh, even being aware that you're aware, I mean, that's not enough. Uh, there's right. so much more than awareness that's necessary. You got to have some control. You got to be able to drive. Right. Um, and not just be aware of what's going on, but you got to drive the ship. Right. And so that really gets into the next question that Josh has. How do you, how exactly do you define personhood? Um, okay. So first a person, the person is created in the image and likeness of God. Okay. Uh, God is a personal being and the, you know, he's tri-personal, um, but God is a personal being. And thus those who are created in his likeness are also personal beings. Um, that's what grants. I mean, think about this. That's what grants, uh, persons, human persons with objective and unalienable rights that ought not be violated by anybody, including governments. Mm -hmm. Don't get me started. I uh, don't get, you know, I can get political here pretty quickly, but America's philosophical and theological foundations, contrary to popular opinion, America is founded on a theological foundation that's objectively true. And that's right. why we've got a pretty good place to live that we need to defend mm -hmm. um, from, uh, from enemies um, on the other side of our borders or enemies within our borders, but foreign and domestic, uh, foreign and domestic. But yep, let me sir. tell you, America's philosophical and theological foundations got that objective truth exactly right. And that's why, even though yeah. uh, America has made many mistakes along the way, we have been the greatest nation to ever exist. And that's why everyone, um, I mean, not everyone, but that's why there's millions and millions and millions of people who want to cross our borders and live here. Why? That's because right. I say that we got some things exactly right, and that allows us to fix mistakes we made along the past. I think we're doing a pretty bad job in a lot of ways right now. But if we don't destroy our theological foundations, uh, then we've got a, a shot to recover. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, we don't don't take those theological foundations lightly. Don't take them for granted because uh, the, the Declaration of Independence realizes that we get these rights from God, from our creator. And that's why we've got these unalienable rights that ought not be violated by anybody, including governments. That's what makes you a person. All right. So that's your first question. Mm -hmm. uh, what makes us a person? Right. Um, now, I will say that. I, according accordingly, angels and demons are personal beings too. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. Second, uh, persons possess the capacity for uh, intentionality, uh, the ability to yeah. think of and about things. Um, so uh, my wife is not with me in the studio, but I can think about my wife. 
Yeah. That's right. Uh, the, 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 the laptop I'm looking into, um, or the, this camera, uh, is not about the laptop and the laptop is not about the microphone that I'm speaking into. Mm -hmm. Uh, this table in front of me is not about the chair I'm sitting on or, and the chair is not of the table. Uh, um, but persons can be of and about things. And so I think that's a, something else we need to, uh, uh, include. Um, third, what makes a person a person? Uh, well, I'd say, what distinguishes persons from puppets is the capacity of libertarian freedom, at least on occasion. Mm -hmm. uh, man, don't take my word for it. Uh, uh, consider what a couple top ranked philosophers have said. You know, Eleanor Stump, I've, I've shared this quote on your show before. Yeah. But Eleanor Stump is saying, hey, if one person continuously uh, produces thoughts and another person, then that other person has ceased to be a person and is instead a puppet of the person determining the thoughts. Right. So, right. Um, and she says an agent's or a person's second order volitions cannot be produced or determined in the sense by something else. If mm. you if everything about you is determined by someone else, you are a puppet. You can say no, but puppets don't have intentionality. Okay, if everything about you is determined by something or someone else, you're a puppet. And, and Joshua Rasmussen in his book, uh, his recent book, says, who are you really? Mm -hmm. um, he, he says that too. He says, uh, you know, if something or someone else, I'm going to, not a direct quote, but if something or someone else is pulling all the strings on your behavior, you're a puppet in at least a couple ways. Number one, uh, your behavior, this includes your thinking behavior, is completely controlled by something that you don't have control over. And number two, you're controlled by things of which you're not aware of. Um, so, you know, he, he's talking about how if mindless stuff is control over everything in your mind, then you're in control of nothing in your mind. And so there he says, you're a puppet. Now I'll say that's definitely true. If mindless, this is a problem with naturalism uh -huh. um, or physicalism or materialism or whatever, however you want to define those terms. But um but if atheism is true, it seems that uh, something or someone else uh, that is mindless is in, if de especially if determinism is true, mm -hmm. uh, then something or someone else is in control over everything in your mind. And now if it's Christian determinism um, or, or Calvinistic determinism, mm -hmm. uh, then you've got something or someone else, another person determining everything in your mind. So you're in control of nothing in your mind. So definitely that's, that's more of a puppet than the guy that's being controlled and determined by non-rational mindless stuff because puppets are usually controlled by other agents. And so here with this with right. determinism in mind, you are literally a puppet being determined by the puppeteer, by someone else controlling and determining everything about you including what you think of how you think about it how you experience reason all, none of that's up to you so it's still fair to say you're a puppet no matter how much they want to say no that's not relevantly analogous yes it is mm -hmm. you know that's it, the difference between a puppet and a person yeah a person is not a puppet sorry no you're no you're good um i i think that's extremely accurate in israel he used the video game analogy with coding and things like that. And I didn't say it on the video, but the thing that was running through my mind at the time is, are you equivocating us to an NPC character? Right, right, right. Because even I have control over the first person or third person character that I'm controlling, right? Jumping and running. But are you saying we're like an NPC? Uh, oh, I don't yeah. know. We don't know that in a great recent movie, what is it? Uh, the free will guy or the free guy? I can't remember what it's called. Oh, I don't know. Um, it's yeah, it just came out in the last year or two. Okay, I wrote a uh, an article about it on my website. I think it's called Free Guy. Um, great movie, and it's about this NPC character who suddenly gets agency. Oh, wow, yeah, and uh, so now he's he's got libertarian freedom and he's not determined by something or someone else so and that's the whole plot right there and it's a great story i highly I, 
I think it, it's called Free Guy. Does it got Ryan Reynolds in it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yep, Free Guy. I, I'm looking yeah. at it right now. Okay, yeah, yeah. he's yeah, he's hilarious. Yeah. Um, great movie. But yeah, that's uh, appealing to the NPC character isn't going to get him off any hooks. <sighs> no, not at all. Not at all. Okay, so the next question Josh has is how important is it for person personhood not to be reducible to an emergent property of the material world? even if the material world is made of thoughts? Um, I guess I'd say the importance lies in what we've been discussing, mm -hmm. uh, personhood versus puppethood, and active agency versus passive cogs, uh, drivers versus backseat passengers. So I guess I need Josh here to clarify if I'm missing his point there. But yeah, I mean... Uh, emergent properties if i mean if that's deterministic i mean so I've, i mean it depends what one means by emergent pro i've i've talked to i talked to one philosophy student who is an atheist who wants to say that he's an atheist a naturalist in a sense and i would say well he's not a robust naturalist but he would say that there's emergent properties of the mind um that are based upon the physical and the physical uh, um, <laughs> Uh, produces a mind that emerges from the physical. The mind, you would say, is still immaterial. So he's helping himself to, he's not a staunch naturalist at this point. He's helping himself to immaterial realities. And then I kept pushing him on that. And he, I mean, such an ad hoc move. He's like, yeah, but then um, the this immaterial mind can break free from what produced it and now can turn around and control it. So he wants to get, everything that comes naturally so to speak wow. um with the christian worldview he's just trying to trying so hard to get everything that christians have access to that are built into the system um and still be an, uh, an atheist yeah. yeah he sees the problem when it comes to rationality right uh, and things like that but i mean ad hoc i mean uh, jp Moreland has written on this in the literature and i'm he is currently writing much more on this like like look if you're a naturalist, libertarian freedom does not fit nicely with your worldview. Okay. Um, he's, I, I'm, I've actually read this uh, paper that he's working on right now. Okay. Um, and he is going, I think he does a fantastic job of showing that uh, libertarian freedom uh, doesn't fit nicely in a, in a naturalistic worldview, but it fits quite nicely uh, with Christian theism. Um, that, that libertarian freedom is at home with Christian theism as much as Calvinists want to say it's not. Um, JP is saying, yeah, it fits quite nicely, and here's why. So I don't want to yeah. uh, spill the beans there, but yeah, that's, yeah. What he's, that's what he's going to be arguing for in this paper. You know, and it seems just intuitively, right, that that makes sense, right? I mean, theism and atheism should be natural odds with each other it just seems weird to me yeah. to have something that an atheistic philosopher you know affirms like naturalistic determinism for a christian to come back over and say you know what you guys got that one right i'm gonna apply it to this i mean right. don't get me wrong i'm sure there's a fallacy in there somewhere but it just seems weird to me to do that you see what yeah. i'm saying mm -hmm. um okay right on i i think if i if i know josh and and i might be wrong on this but i think he was uh, referring to like idealism in this question mm -hmm. and, and something that is, and I might mispronounce this. So correct me if I'm wrong. You probably heard of it, but is it bungle theory? Yeah. Where is bundle that theory. bundle theory, bundle theory? That's it. Basically where I, I guess things break down into just propositions. Is, is that, am I explaining that right or not? Not right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's see what is, uh, what's his, what's his question? So, so, well, I, I was just saying his, that oh. question I just asked you, I think that's what he's referring to whenever oh. Israel appealed to idealism and, oh, okay. and yeah. bundle theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So the next question Josh has, is it conspicuously fitting for determinists to center their analogies around impersonal or in, in inanimate things? <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's gripe at us for saying yeah, that. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> I got uh, something I want to share here. Yeah. Oh, you want to share your screen, you mean? No, 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 no. Just oh, okay. Find this. Okay, here yeah. it is. Yeah. So, yeah, before I get to that, I'll say it, it, um, I think it speaks volumes. Uh, for example, 
Um, I recently noted in the YouTube video uh, that sparked this entire discussion. Um, a great, here's a great quote from Richard Brian Davis that I, I just uh, got up here in a second. Yeah. Um, he says, the reason we don't blame clocks for their evil doing is that we recognize that they cannot avoid doing what they do. Given the arrangements of their parts and the laws govern governing their mechanical interactions, they operate out of sheer necessity. They don't have the power of doing good or evil because they don't have the power to decide to do otherwise. And that's mm -hmm. in a great book called Explaining Evil, um, page 15, if anybody wants to go check that out. But wow. um, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll hear it quite often. And this was actually the point of the a video that Israel initially responded to. And in fact, I think I shared that quote in that, in that video that I just read mm -hmm. um, that, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, uh, you're, if, if they're, they're appealing to general reliability yeah. and you'll hear them constantly go back, well, clocks and watches, you know, they're generally reliable. They're not, they're not, perfect but they're generally reliable therefore you can trust them and my whole point is uh there's a difference here between a, a watch that's generally reliable and a generally reliable liar a person an agent and uh intentional agents with the power of libertarian freedom um, who can choose to deceive or not to deceive are in an entirely different category than a clock right now, so it's attention getting that Calvinists often cite clocks, <laughs> but, as, but then as soon as you bring up puppets or robots, they cry fi uh, foul. They're like, oh, that's not fair. You can't do that. But then, you know, they're often doing it themselves. So, um, yeah, I, to answer the question, it is uh, odd um, that uh, they're the ones actually that try to compare humans to inanimate objects. And as soon as we do that. Um, they, they cry foul, foul. So double standard Calvinist. Double well, standard. I, mean, <laughs> no, I, you know, I mean, they're not doing that on purpose. No, I know. Um, right, right. But it is. Uh, it's interesting. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. And now maybe that you brought that up, maybe they'll they'll shift away from doing that. Right. Like that would be we'll see. that'd be good. OK, yeah. so the next question Josh has is can't. So let's go back to increasing levels of complex awareness now. Josh asks, can increasing levels of complex awareness, what he would call an experiential agency rather than free agency, explain, can it actually explain moral responsibility? Uh, no, not, not, apart, not apart from libertarian freedom. So remember, uh, we just discussed why mere awareness is not enough. You've got to be a driver That's right. and not, a, not simply a backseat passenger. And I've shown if something or someone else determines the entirety of human of a human's mental activity, then the human is not epistemically responsible. And if a human is not epistemically responsible, then the human is not morally responsible. And this is why we have the age of accountability um, and why the 10-year-old the who robs the bank uh, doesn't go to the state pen. All right. In fact, uh, I just had a conversation about this with uh, Dr. Adam Lloyd Johnson yesterday. We had a phone call. Okay. Um, he's a good friend. You got to have him on your show sometime. See uh, Dr. Adam Lloyd Johnson's website. It's called Convincing Proof. I think he's got a YouTube video okay. under that name too. He's been on a uh, guest on my show. Um, we're good friends. But yeah, he wrote a book, awesome book called Divine Love Theory. And he is recognized as one of the leading moral philosophers in the world today. And he's going to be the first one to tell you that moral responsibility entails libertarian freedom. In fact, you know, I said, I, I'm aware of a paper that uh, JP is writing. Well, uh, I'll just say that, you know, stay tuned for some work um, from Adam Lloyd Johnson. Okay. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think if, if one is not epistemically responsible, then one is not morally responsible and our current justice system uh, seems to understand this truth quite nicely we don't the, the 10 year old who robs the bank doesn't go to the state pen but if i do that they're locking me up forever yeah you said um 
uh, his website, uh, Dr. Johnson's website was convincingproof.com. I, I think that's it. Okay. Off the top of my head. And he wrote a book called Divine Love Theory. Right? Yeah. It okay. shows how it is really a defense of the uh, moral argument mm -hmm. and interacting with guys like uh, atheists like Eric Wielenberg. He's really focused on Wielenberg's argument. Oh, um, okay. And, you know, so you'll hear this all the time on social media, on Twitter, X, Facebook. I have all these atheists are like, how come apologists never deal with Eric Wielenberg's work? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Like we do, bro. Yeah. I've written, I've written, uh, go to my website. I've uh, talked about it on my YouTube channel, Dr. Adam Lloyd Johnson, a philosopher, not merely an apologist. <laughs> he has written an entire book on it, a couple books now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, we have really good reason to reject the attempts of escaping uh, the moral arguments, conclusions that these atheists have offered. And I think Adam Lloyd Johnson does a fantastic job of doing that. So I would encourage you. Uh, to have him on your show sometime soon. Okay. All right. If I can find some contact info for him, I will definitely reach out. Oh, uh, well, just ask me. I'll give you his phone number. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Not Fair here enough. on camera, but. Right, right. No, <laughs> I'll save that for a private chat. But right. okay. Right. Well, I appreciate that, uh, mm -hmm. Tim. Okay. So Josh's next question, and this, this was interesting to me. So he asked, does the ability to deceive our senses amount to the senses themselves being deceptive. All right. Um, say that again. Yeah. Does uh, yeah, I'll, I'll reword it a little bit. Does the ability to deceive our senses amount to the senses being deceptive in and of themselves? Okay. I say no. Our senses might initially... Hope, hopefully I'm understanding this, but our senses might initially make us think, say you're driving down the highway on a hot summer's day mm -hmm. and you look down the road and our senses might make us think, oh, wow, there's, look at all that water down there, right? Okay. Like a mirage. A like, like mirage. Yeah. I remember, yep. I remember being a little kid um, in probably in elementary school mm -hmm. and my mom doing that to me one day, we were driving uh, out in the country and she's like, look at all that water up there. I'm like, whoa. And then she's like, oh, we're still not there yet. What do you think we're going to get there? <laughs> and then yeah, she yeah. taught me. Now she didn't deceive me forever, but she used that as a learning experience. And she taught me about mirages. She had a good reason to deceive you. Yeah. Well, well yeah, it was, it was a learning experience. There you go. Um, now our senses might initially make us think there's water down the road on a hot summer's day, but we're not stuck with those beliefs. Just like my mom made sure I wasn't stuck with that belief. Um, and this is why I appeal to that carefulness condition. If we are careful, we can attain truth even when our senses provide illusions or mirages, right? I'm not stuck with thinking there's flooding down the road. I'm not stuck with thinking the stick in the water is bent. I can do my due diligence and discover truth if I'm not lazy and if I'm careful, if I bracket my biases, if I'm willing to consider other arguments. This gets us into indirect doxastic voluntarism again. Okay. Um, and, and the ability to do at least indirectly control and determine what I believe. Um, that is not compatible with exhaustive divine determinism or determinism, uh, you know, exhaustive determinism in, in general. Um, so... No, just because I see a mirage or an illusion, um, because my because my senses are functioning properly, actually, doesn't mean I'm stuck with bad beliefs. And that's why now when I see water down the road, I know it's not really water down the road. Or when I see the, the bent stick in the water, I know it's not bent like that. Right? I've, I've done enough careful thinking to I don't even ha have to check anymore. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if God determines, here's the thing, if, if God determined, uh, I want to get this back to being careful and how this carefulness condition is not compatible with Ed or exhaustive divine determinism, because if God determines the entirety of your mental activity, then you are stuck with what he determines. You have no carefulness condition. You either believe true things or you don't. It's not up to you. It's up to God. And if God determines you, 
to have a false belief, you can't be more careful to infer a better belief or to infer truth at all. You don't have this carefulness condition if Ed is true. You might feel like you have it, but again, that's just you being, you know, tripping on acid. Right? You mm -hmm. don't really have it. You don't have that control. So that's how I answer that question. So then it sounds like that that would spell the same disaster for rationality and for the exact same reason. Am I right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's no escape if one affirms Ed. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Right on. I think that's extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. So I think this might be, yeah, Josh just has two more questions. Right. Um, is substance dualism and, and, and we hit on this a little bit ago. So if you want to, um, not skip it, but, but kind of, you know, shrink it down a little bit, you feel free, but is substance dualism bunk now <laughs> because our senses distill the data of the external world world into a usable image instead of an unbounded disembodied access to all complexity at once. Okay. No. Um, as I noted, we, we are not stuck with these usable images. Mm -hmm. um, we, I think this is really a silly objection if I'm understanding it right. Okay. Uh, but if, if that objection passed, then it would work against idealism too. I mean, after all, it really seems like physical, the physical material world actually exists, but on idealism, it does not exist in the manner in which it appears to exist. Yeah. So my point is that this is not an objection against substance dualism or idealism. On both views, we are not stuck with being deceived. On Ed, if exhaustive divine determinism is true, however, then we're stuck with what God determines us to think is true and justified when it's actually false. Um, so that's the big problem there. Hope I understood the question. I think so. I think so. All right. His last question. And then I think I've just got one more. Yeah. Yeah. One more after this. So how do we establish that creation is a real thing, something made by God in some real sense, separate from God, rather than this odd kind of divine solipsism Israel was describing. Yeah, and I think we talked about this a little bit ago, but yeah, as I noted, although I do not affirm idealism, it is my fallback view. Mm -hmm. So if God wants to create a matrix-like world, that's his prerogative. I'm actually cool with that. In fact, I think it'd be really awesome if he <laughs> did it that way. Yeah, um, I'm not opposed to it by any means. Now, let the, you know, the guy watching your video here, be careful. Do not say, oh, Tim Stratton's an idealist. No, I'm not. I'm a substance dualist. I think the physical world really exists. And I think my, uh, the thing I refer to as I is an immaterial image of God, an immaterial mind, an immaterial thinking thing created in the likeness of God who does have the supernatural power to move my physical body. Don't ask me how. Actually, I do. I have uh, toyed around with some uh, uh, hypotheses on, on how it works. Okay. I'm um, not willing to die on that hill, but I do have an article on my website okay. uh, where I discuss this. It, um, so just real quick, is there, or, or maybe maybe Josh is misunderstanding this. So is there like similarities between solipsism and idealism? No, they're not the same thing. Uh, the solipsism, I mean, I keep trying to convince all of my friends that solipsism is true. Okay. Uh, but none of them believe me. Okay. Um, not, I mean, think about how silly that is. Yeah, uh, I mean. I'm not a solipsist. Um, so solipsism, uh, right, is the view that uh, um, I'm the only mind. Right. Oh, okay. That makes it. I see. Right. I don't know. I didn't know what solipsism was. So yeah, I, I, I think that's what it is. Wow. Uh, maybe wow. I'm, maybe wow. I'm getting my terms mixed up. Okay. Probably am. But if I'm not, that's, that's what it is. Um, and, uh, but, um, idealism doesn't entail that. I guess it could be, uh, compatible with it, but I, on idealism, like, uh, Johan and Rotz was made clear with, I think I quoted him earlier. You know, you got the immaterial mind of God and all the other immaterial minds in his image and likeness mm -hmm. that he's created. Um, yeah. It's just that we don't take up space. 
in the space time universe as it seems like we do. Because that's just um, the way I understand idealism there. Again, yeah. these are not my focuses, my foci of right. study, right? So I don't claim to be an expert on idealism, things like uh things of that nature just right. with what i've seen of it i have studied it a little bit years ago um and i'm like ah all right kind of like the view I'm not persuaded by it enough to say i am that but i am persuaded by what i've studied enough to say that's a real possibility and right. with my current uh journey of study on the topic i say hmm, that's my fallback position mm -hmm. now so i could be way wrong on that and i don't doesn't really bother me because it's not my my focus of expertise, right? Sure. Now, with all that said, mm -hmm. I'm cool if God wants to create a matrix-like world, um, and I think it would be pretty awesome. But a world made of immaterial information instead of atoms and particles of matter is still distinct from the ultimate mind who made it and created libertarian free minds, immaterial uh, libertarian free minds, in the likeness of the ultimate mind, to mm -hmm. exist within this matrix world. Yep. Um, I don't see that as a problem. I just don't. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, uh, some of the leading Christian idealists today uh, promoting this view would offer uh, this something like that. And so I just don't see a problem with their sure. with their model. See, and now, so because you explained it like that, I, I know, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm about 99% sure I know where Josh was coming from on that because the way it seems like he took Israel to be describing this is because yeah. he, I, I believe, and in Israel, I'm sorry if I'm mischaracterizing you here, I'm not trying to, but I think Josh mm -hmm. understood it to be what God is the only thing that exists really, right? Because in, in reality, um, we are oh. separate in that state, right. in, in that instance, right? But we're in the mind of God. And so it's almost like your vanishing you article or the mm -hmm. vanishing I article that you wrote a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, that's where Josh is connecting solipsism with idealism because the way Israel yeah. is describing it, it sounds like it's only God that exists and we exist in the mind of God, like a container type thing, which, which was weird. Yeah. So no, yeah, the way I would definitely reject idealism in the form that Israel offered. Because he's but connecting with determinism with it. Yes, because right. he's yep. married it to determinism. Yep. And I think that's really a dangerous place to go. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'd just encourage Israel to follow the, the lead of guys like Michael Jones. Yeah. Um, and uh, be, a, be an idealist who rejects determinism. And I, and I then encourage him to be an awesome idealist. He might even be able to persuade me yeah. to come join that team. Yeah. I, I think it'd be interesting to get Michael and Israel on at the same time to talk. Yeah, that would be a good conversation. That'd be interesting. All right. So my last question, and I think, I think my provisionist friends are really going to like me <laughs> for asking this question to you, Tim, uh, because um, I hear Dr. Flowers uh, promote this idea. I hear, you know, cause Josh, he, he like, I swear that dude is, you and Dr. Flower, like he's your guys' biggest fan. Okay. So not, not even wow. a lie. I'm a fan um, of his, fan of his work. He sharpened me like iron. Yeah. Yeah. He and me, me too. Like I said, both of y'all, y'all turned me. So, uh, so I think my provisionist friends will like this. So at the one hour and 25 minute and 18 second mark, I want to be precise with this one because if Israel goes back and listens to what he was saying and connects it the way I am, I think he'll see it. And we'll say, hey, you know what, maybe I'm going to reject this and, and word it differently. But anyway, during an analogy, Israel uh, gives at the one hour, 25 minute mark. He says that the words that someone speaks are identified as an influence and the words themselves uh, are influences and they have causal power. Right. Oh, so, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if this is true then why in the world would he have any problem? And maybe he doesn't, maybe, maybe he affirms this, but if he doesn't, why in the world would he have any problem with a provisionist understanding of Romans 1 16, that the gospel is the literal power of God unto salvation, that there's actually power in the gospel message to transform a person. Deterministic power. 
I mean, I, okay, I got to I got to say that when I heard All right, so you know, I was t- I was telling him, I mean, now we've got a long video here. Apologize for that, but when you're responding to a long video, it's, it's going to take a long, long video to do it. it. Yeah, we got to go yeah. into detail. You know, it's like you know, really, when you object to something, I think it's best to write a 20 page at most uh, mm-hmm. objection. Um, not, now, like Guillaume Bignon didn't like my book. He wrote a 50 page blog, uh, 50 pages mm. um, against it. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've had I was like, bro, uh, standard um, academic uh, <laughs> um, tactics here is to write around a 20 page paper. Okay. But he wrote a 50 page. And so I wrote a 50 page in response. I'm like, and I could have written way more. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I, this this would have been a lot easier if, uh, and I do ask Israel again to to write this out in case we've missed some things here. Yeah. But yeah, we're, our video is long now because we had a long, a long video to respond to. But anyway, Mm -hmm. uh, when I was, when I finally got around and I told Israel, I'm like, dude, this is so long. What am I supposed to do here? And he goes, just listen to the first hour. So I finally went and listened to the first hour. And uh, I was like, I don't think this gets us anywhere. And then I did. I, I haven't listened to the whole thing yet, but I did hear you guys talking about um, this issue. Mm-hmm. And when I, I got to tell you, I was yelling at the screen for a while because y'all were on this tangent about influences and causes. Yeah. And that's not the topic under discussion. What that's is the topic? Sense. Determinism. determinism. Yep. And I was like, oh, if I had hair, I would have pulled it out. <laughs> and you guys spent a lot of time on this too, if I recall. Yeah, um, another hour. Yep. <laughs> you're right. So, so remember, an event is determined if antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate Tate. said right. event. Right. On this definition, influences and other kinds of causation are still compatible. It is determinism or causal determinism that I'm attacking here. That's what I've got in my sites. So to defend influence when I'm attacking determinism is to defend the wrong target, right? You're trying to defend something over there, but I'm, I'm shooting this target. Yeah. And so just because an event is caused, it is not necessarily determined. I, I am caused in a sense by God to be having this conversation right now, but he is not determining me to do so. But okay. if God determines me to affirm a false belief, then he has caused me to affirm a false theological belief. Right. Right. So, so if an event is determined, it is necessarily caused, but just because it's caused doesn't mean it was determined. Okay. So that's why my sites are on uh, determinism, on exhaustive divine determinism. And I often, sometimes I will slip the word caused in there, right? But people should know, unless I say otherwise, when I say caused, I mean causally determined. Um, so that's what I care about here. So does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, I think that you're absolutely right in the sense that it's almost like um, determinism and cause, right? It's they're, they're in, in Greek grammar, um, you've got this idea known as a subset proposition. And basically what it is, is so for example, Tim, you're a man, I'm going to assume your gender for a second, right? But all other men in the world aren't necessarily Tim, right? Now you take this idea and apply it to something like the greatest basketball player is Michael Jordan. Amen Those, you know, there you go. Those mm-hmm. two are convertible propositions one equals the other right michael jordan equals the greatest basketball player the greatest basketball player equals michael jordan Mm -hmm. but on a subset proposition even though determinism entails causation causation doesn't necessarily entail determinism so i think that's extremely helpful and i hope that i broke that down for our audience as well even more uh, than what you did so yeah yeah i agree a hundred percent um well tim this has been long this has been fun though and i think even better than all of those it's been extremely edifying and so i just want to thank you for taking three hours out of your day to come on hang out with me talk about this um and and really just dive deeper into it because again this is a conversation 
that I think you said it in uh, a little bit earlier in, on in this video, and I think it was between you and Colton, right? Whenever you responded mm -hmm. to him, a lot of the time, what happens is you guys are just ship selling in the night and you go right past each other, right? Not you mm -hmm. necessarily, but people that engage in this discussion yeah. because we're using different definitions. We're not understanding mm -hmm. the concepts. And so if I can flush out, I still have a passion for this topic. And if I can help flesh that out in any way, shape or form, I want to do that to help people make a good and rational decision in, in, in making a decision on this topic. And so I want to thank you for helping me do that and, and continuing to do that in your own ministry as well. Well, thank you. Like I said, I, I only care about truth. Uh, I could care less about Molinism and uh, libertarian freedom and substance dualism. Yeah. <laughs> I deal with a lot. The reason why I do affirm these things is because I think they're probably true. Yeah. Um, and, uh, um, and that's because I think they're true. That's why I argue uh, so, so much for these things and, and act in the academic literature and in my popular work, I'm mm -hmm. trying hard to advance truth to the masses I know I don't, I'm, I'm not always perfect in how I do it. I'm just, a, I'm just a dumb youth pastor who stumbled around and found himself swimming in these waters. Um, and the other day, a guy, and he apologized for this, but he, he is trying to insult me. And he's like, you're just insecure uh, because you know that you don't deserve to be uh, in the circle with all these other academics. And I'm like, yeah. That's right. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I probably am somewhat insecure about that because I am on this, you know, swimming in these waters with all these guys that yeah. are intellectual heroes of mine. And I don't consider, I said, I said, I consider myself to be the Christian Leitner at the end of the bench on the 1992 uh, Olympic dream team. Um, he didn't deserve to be on that team. Right. And, he, and he hardly ever played, you know, right. but, uh, you know, Magic Bird and Jordan and Barkley and Carl Malone and all these other guys are are uh, getting all the minutes. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, I'm just happy to be on the end of the bench. And uh, if I can do anything to even help the, the starters get better, yeah. then I'm just thrilled to death. And, yeah, sometimes, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I don't feel like I deserve to be – doing the stuff that God's got me doing. But since I'm here, just trying really hard to bring them glory and to try to get truth. And if I'm wrong, I want to, I want to know. So yeah. whether we deserve it or not, it's one thing. I think being put in the situation, God sees something there. And the, 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 I think the best thing we can do is to do our best in whatever situation God puts us in. So, and that requires that. libertarian freedom. That's right. You can't do a your best. Men. <laughs> you right, can't brother. do your best if God determines you to right. do something. You can't do your best to do it better. That's right. <laughs> or whatever. That's right. Yeah. Words of wisdom from uh, Tim Stratton. Quote him. Quote him on that one day. <laughs> All right, brother man. Well, I like I said, I thank you. Um, hang out for a second if you can, uh, till mm -hmm. after the outro video plays. All right. Um, I'll run some stuff by you and then okay. we'll go. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. For this awesome discussion, Dr. Tim Stratton, uh, YouTube Free Thinking Ministries. And mm -hmm. he's also, if you want, go ahead and plug your websites again, uh, Tim. Yeah, uh, freethinkinc.org. That's freethinkinc.org. And then uh, freethinkingministries.com. Right on. Buy his book, read his articles, check out his article with JP Moreland. It's free, it's on his website. Uh, you can get that for free. And uh, yeah, buy some merch from the guy, support his ministry <laughs> and support ours as well by first and foremost, primarily praying for our ministry that God would work uh, in us and through us and with us um, to, to reach the masses like like Dr. Stratton's trying to do with his ministry. We are doing trying to do the exact same thing. Our YouTube subscribers are growing by the day. We're almost in 2000 now. So nice. please like this content, share it with as many people as you can and subscribe. If you haven't yet, you can always donate to our ministry uh, via Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, sending us Super Chats. Um, that That's probably the easiest way to do it on YouTube is send us Super Chats or Super Thanks. Uh, leave a comment and we will get that. Uh, but other than that, y'all have been great. Good night. God bless. 
and stay like Christ.